Okay, good morning. May the 4th be with you or something like that. It is uh, <laughs> Thursday, May 4th. I'm Commissioner Ed Rothstein. Um, welcome this morning uh, to our open session. As always, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. And I know there was a, a few tragedies, one in Texas and one in Atlanta, that, uh, you know, again, keeping people's memories in our thoughts and prayers and let their memories be a blessing to all those that knew them. Um, just continuing to see how this goes along. Amen. Uh, okay, let's stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. I'll tell you, I do like uh, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance with uh, with the background. It makes it really cool, and I like it. So, just my personal preference. I think we have a couple of uh, Priority Carol um, activities happening, um, but before we go on to that, why don't we go around the dais and see what's on our mind, and uh, we'll take it from there. Commissioner Guerin. What's in your mind? Sure, I'll, I'll be brief. So last week, I mentioned we had a couple of municipal elections taking place. Some of the towns have spoken. I want to congratulate all the winners. I uh, particularly want to congratulate the three uh, congratulate the three gentlemen from uh, Mount Airy who won for the count, town council there: Jason Evans, Tim Washabaugh, and Carl Munder. I also wanted to congratulate the people who got involved in the race that didn't win, uh, because you've heard you've heard me speak time and time again. The need for people to get involved in their local elections. Uh, I was disappointed in some of the numbers and some of the turnouts. I think uh, I think the towns uh, we need to do better to get people out to vote. But I think it's important for people to get involved. And for those who got involved in their town elections and won, and for those who lost, uh, you did not sit on the sidelines. You did not just um, add to the. Uh, to the, uh, I guess, the, the den of, of uh, this, those that just complain and do nothing. You got involved, and I commend you for doing so. And, uh, again, congratulations to the winners. And uh, I think as a commission, we look forward to working with all of them. There's a couple more local elections. All right, the big ones, when's Westminster? That's next Tuesday. That's next Tuesday, okay. Right. So, yeah. And Sykesville was yesterday. That was, was yesterday, yesterday, but that was unopposed, I know. Yeah, and New Windsor was yesterday? I know Tawny Town's over. I know I Mount Airy's so. over. I'm not sure yeah. about. I think they're coming next okay, week. That's what I thought. Week. New Windsur. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. That okay. Union Bridge and. Uh, all right. Is that okay. is that no? But good that's point. Right. Okay. But that's all for me. Thank you. No, oh, thank you, Commissioner Gordon. Thank you. Um, last Thursday, and I'm going to be a little brief on this. I'm going to let Commissioner Kyler talk more on this than I. But uh, Commissioner Kyler, myself, and uh, former Commissioner Weaver attended the unveiling of the Tommy Dale parking lot at the Ag Center. Um, as both all three of us know the Dell family well, I think it was an honor and a privilege to be a part of that, and I think it was a uh, a testament to uh, Tommy Dell's uh, involvement and dedication and love for the community, Ag and his family, that uh, we saw that that event occur, and uh, it was very nice to see the Dell family all in attendance as well as a wide array of the members of the community, and uh, it was a very nice event. Uh, this past, uh, so I guess last Wednesday, I guess it was. Uh, uh, myself, Commissioner Kyler, Vigliotti, and Rothstein were at the uh, Coffee with Kevin that the North, North Carroll Business Alliance held at the Ag Center. Uh, it was a great opportunity to interact with our new Secretary of Agriculture, Kevin Attix. Um, I've met Kevin before, and I look forward to seeing what other opportunities we have. There was a lot of conversation pertaining to what is ag. Carroll County, obviously, is a heavily ag-based community, and I think there's a lot of opportunity, and I look forward to seeing uh, what we can do and accomplish collectively and together with Kevin and the state of Maryland. And then uh, this past uh, beginning of the week, I was at the Downtown Westminster Business Association. It was roughly about 40 attendees, uh, mostly local businesses, as well as some uh, members of the uh, Westminster uh, staff. 
Uh, it was a very nice turnout to see uh, the thoughts and opinions and ideas of our local business owners, which you know they are the heart of our community you know whether it be jobs whether it be employment uh revenue and all of the wonderful things that our local businesses do it was great to see and hear some of the uh interesting and uh, creative ideas coming out of westminster and small business and uh a little surprise i haven't had the opportunity to share with my fellow commissioners yet but um uh, May 4th through 7th is Light the Night for Fallen Firefighters. Um, it's an evening to light up red for fallen firefighters from the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, honoring and remembering the sacrifice of America's fallen fire heroes. So uh, we will be lighting up the county building as of this evening in honor of that for the next several days. And uh, I appreciate everybody just keeping those folks in their minds and their hearts and remembering <coughs> that they do pay sacrifice. And while Many of our brave men and women that fight uh, fires for us have the expectation of coming home every evening. Some may or may not. And I hope that we at least recognize and appreciate all that they do for us. And that's all I have. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Kyler, what's in your mind? Um, and uh, I, I assume we'll talk about that a little more, but I can't wait for Sunday's veterans celebration. Mm -hmm that's so important for veterans survivors families and uh and anyone in who wants to come out and have a fun day um it's free there's a lot of giveaways there's a lot of vendors slash services that have uh displays and can and can really tell you um some opportunities for veterans so that look forward to that that'll be fun as commissioner gordon said um last thursday they dedicated the uh, arch at the Ag Center to <coughs> Tommy Dell. His daughter, Josie, designed it. And uh, his son, Grady, is probably in the Midwest combining by the day. They, they, uh, they've had to push the, uh, everybody uh, moans about contractors, but they had to push the contractor a little bit to make sure it was done before Grady left. Mm -hmm. and, and it was great. And uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of Manchester wrestling family there, the Dell family there, and, and the Ag Center people that, that all seem to do so much. Um, last, last Thursday also, I think, I met with Bill Hudson um, with uh, former students and friends of Robert Moten. We had a great couple hour discussion and uh, talked about that in my, my humble opinion they they need to get a little bit more proactive about what they want to do but i also found out some things and i haven't talked to uh to uh Rec and parks that kind of manages the building people are using their room for lunch they're even coming into the building and they know the code on the door and they unlock it and go in and use their refrigerator and have lunch yeah. which uh <clears throat> I had kind of criticized that they don't have more things on display in the room and they said we're afraid to if it's everybody's lunch room we can't hardly put artifacts and stuff out so um, hopefully that's something we can check on and curb a little bit um, if it is their room and I know uh, Rec and Parks and Elections occasionally call them and say we'd really like to use your room for a meeting and they all coordinate it and that's great you know it's they should all share but it's not everybody's lunch room um friday i help stuff bags for sunday's event um a great group of staff and volunteers how many bags uh, we Bunch. stuffed a thousand almost a thousand yeah and uh um, a great assembly line mission barbecue food <laughs> and a uh, good talk while we were doing it and and uh, just a great group of staff and volunteers make all that stuff happen then the chamber of commerce breakfast in tony town listened to a very good speaker learned a lot of history <laughs> um, i'm still glad i'm a math major but it's i, I like listening to history about pirates and everything <laughs> <laughs> um last night Rhonda and I got to go to uh, Bill and Robin Chesley's house in Harwood, Maryland. They flew in Dan Gable, and I know uh, not everybody's 100% into wrestling, but Dan Gable probably, 
graduated in 1970 or 71, mm -hmm. was undefeated in college and lost his uh, last match ever in college. And uh, the photo, while it's up there, the one on the left, on the left is, is Dan Gable and uh, great guy. The next guy is Ed Kelly, who's a Maryland referee, mm -hmm. who's actually being inducted into the Hall of Fame in Stillwater, Oklahoma next month. The next is my son, Andy, who now runs Manchester Wrestling. And the last is my wife and boss, Rhonda. She's laughing, Dan's laughing. Everybody's <coughs> there to talk wrestling and talk. Uh, he's great motivational speaker. I mean, he let the press distract him in his last match in college and lost a match he shouldn't have lost. To a freshman. So the next day, he called three very good Iowa State wrestlers, met them in the wrestling room. I almost said beat the hell out of them, but mm -hmm. um, he yeah, pretty much did for about an hour or two because he said, I, I got to fix. You know, I broke something and I got to fix it. He's just great motivation. But what happens, we're all there to hear all that. My lovely wife, Rhonda, says something to him about his four daughters and 14 grandchildren. Mm -hmm. They must have talked for 15 minutes that children shouldn't be allowed to move more than two hours away. And, and he's, <laughs> he's got to watch 170 Little League baseball games <laughs> this spring. And they just stood back and forth comparing grandchildren. And, and I just thought it was awesome. And then the next picture is more discussion after Rhonda got out of the way and let us talk wrestling again. <laughs> but uh, just a great night. And uh, Bill Chesley was inducted into uh, the Hall of Fame last year as Outstanding American. He wrestled in high school, did not go to college, did a couple internships with unions and stuff, and then decided he wanted to get into real estate. And uh, he's done quite well. And uh, he pretty much... He and Robin had 200 people at their house last night, fed them, had open bars, so Dan Gable could come meet everybody. And it's just an awesome family and uh, an awesome time. Went to the sheriff's breakfast this morning, and that was a great event as always, and uh, listened to uh, the multiple prayers. And, and that, you know, that was a good group there. And I try to say it every Thursday, but I love Carroll County. And you just look at the different people that work hard, volunteer, the breakfast, and, and all that. It's uh, Carroll County is a pretty great place. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Commissioner uh, Vigliotti, Joe, what's on your mind? Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so I will also try to be brief because I know we have a lot ahead of us today. So I also attended the Sheriff's Prayer Breakfast this morning along with everybody, and that was a, <clears throat> was a wonderful opportunity to, to sit and pray with members of the law enforcement community. Um, as uh, Commissioner Kyler alluded to, I had the uh, honor of uh, speaking at the Chamber of Commerce and Carroll County Public Library uh, District 1 breakfast on uh, uh, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Took me a second to remember that because Monday was sit City of Tawny Town's election. Tuesday was the uh, breakfast, and I thank both Commissioner Rossi and Commissioner Kyler and uh, County Administrator uh, Roberta Windham for attending. Uh, and if anybody's curious, uh, there was a question that was posed about how you go about changing culture over time, and it seems like things end up, uh, you know, for the worse rather than the better, sooner rather than later. And so I brought up the example of Woods Rogers, who was a famous pirate hunter who went down to the Caribbean in the uh, early 1700s with a fleet of ships, and a huge portion of the uh, number of British Marines and uh, sailors that he took with them to fight the pirates ended up joining the pirates because it was a lot easier to, you know, go after other ships than try to uphold the law. But Woods Rogers stuck it out, and he was the uh, reason that the culture down there ultimately changed when the uh, pirates ended up on the uh, losing side. Um, as Commissioner Guerin had noted a little while ago, uh, municipal elections are in uh, full swing right now. The city of Tawnytown had their elections on Monday evening. We have a, a new mayor, uh, Christopher Miller, so congratulations to him. And we have two new council members in Tawnytown, Chris Tillman and Jim McCarran, who incidentally was a former mayor of the city of Tawnytown. I also want to extend my uh, congratulations and best wishes to sitting mayor Brad Wance and uh, outgoing councilman Dan Haynes on hard-fought campaigns and for the service that they've provided over the last several years. 
Uh, and uh, last but not least, I want to uh, mention that uh, Union Bridge on May 20th, 20th will be holding their annual Rubber Duck Derby. Uh, at the uh, Donald D. Wilson Walking Trail and Bridge, and you can adopt ducks for the race and for the first three through the finish line. Uh, they'll win gift certificates, and there will be random duck drawings for additional prizes. Uh, if you want more details, you can follow Dream Big Union Bridge on Facebook. It is a family-friendly event uh, with a duck race, a jeep show, music, food, vendors, a petting zoo, kids' games, and more. Uh, and uh, I, believe th I believe that's all from me this morning, so thank you. Okay, so difficult to follow Commissioner Vigliotti with pirates and uh, Mr. Burke. Do you have anything you want to share? I don't. Okay, just M Mr. Checking. Mr. Burke is a lawyer. Doesn't that qualify him as a, a I, just just uh, ask as a pirate? So. <laughs> <laughs> as a pirate. <laughs> okay, so a couple things. One, um, yesterday, <clears throat> the Carroll um, Public Schools held their spring challenge, uh, and that's a opportunity for um, our students. Uh, in the public school system to compete as athletes or student athletes to compete in various um, uh, activities and sporting events uh, and these children are with special needs and it goes from the elementary uh, through the high schools and it was held at Westminster um, High School on their fields. It was a bit chilly and that did not deter anyone, uh, any one of those athletes for being out there. So I really do applaud um, all of them and the coaches and the volunteers uh, that participate with them. Um, I used to, before Army was a special ed teacher, was a coach and a hugger and all that kind of stuff with Special Olympics. So it's something near and dear. It's, this was not Special Olympics. It's special Olympics is more regimented. So this was what's called a, uh, a spring challenge to kind of open up the op more opportunities for these uh, athletes to compete in more events. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun yesterday uh, morning. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, the veterans event, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think we've got it uh, covered as far as getting it out there uh, on Sunday, which will be perfect weather. Um, from 12 to 4, we have the six-string band from the U.S. Army Field Band. We have Reagan years, um, a lot of opportunities, uh, especially to recognize veterans and their families, uh, specifically this time veterans of the um, uh, Afghan um, war or um, those that deployed into Afghan theater, Afghanistan theater of operations. Um, but just great opportunity for children, veterans, those that support veterans, families. I know I'm a broken record sometimes just sharing that nobody does it better than Carroll County when it comes to Carroll uh, taking care of our veterans. And um, I don't look very much further than our own team that packages us together and works hand in hand with our, um, uh, you know, VSOs, the veteran support organizations, and just taking care of our veterans and our Veterans Advisory Council. So I, I applaud everybody that's been engaged in doing this in preparation for this. It's at the Farm Museum uh, and um, 12 o'clock, so it should be a lot, a lot of fun. The last thing is, uh, it was brought to my attention a young man, uh, Ben Bergamashi, who um, is an Eagle Scout. And uh, his, he became an Eagle Scout, the Court of Honor, back in uh, June of 22. And I had the, um, the honor of uh, uh, participating in that Court of Honor. And um, his project uh, is over at uh, Piney, uh, Piney Ridge as far as uh, Piney Run Park, excuse me, um, where, where he has uh, three life-saving stations. That's what he put together as his project. Well, that project got recognized by the Baltimore Area Council, so the entire region, and um, that's pretty cool stuff. I mean, one, just knowing that these Eagle Scouts, you know, two to three percent, I mean, I know, Tom, you're an Eagle Scout, I mean, just an honor, it's something that is always with you once you're an Eagle Scout, and you're proud to have the opportunity to be that Eagle Scout for life. Uh, it's a very special um, 
club of uh, young leaders that turn into, you know, older leaders, you know, like, I think you're the only one of us. I believe. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, so really just proud of that. But uh, I wanted to throw that out there, um, you know, because Ben is a, a wonderful young man and just wanted to say congratulations. Good luck. Um on the uh, event that'll be coming up um, in June in the summer over in uh, Baltimore at the Maryland Science Center. Um, we have a couple of uh, Priority Carol activities before we get into our agenda items. Why don't we start with the library first and then we're gonna segue into um, the Bureau of Aging Disabilities because then you have an open item right afterwards. So I know the library was asking for a little bit of time and opportunity if you want to have a seat and tell us what, what's on your mind. So, Ladies. Good morning. We good won't morning. take very long. As you all know, we are wrapping up uh, National Library Week. Uh, was just with us and we've also finished our Battle of the Books. Um, and we really appreciate the commissioners ongoing support of our efforts to make this a literate reader friendly community and so in a tradition the library has held for more years than i've been around um we have read new read posters for all the commissioners so you can you know hang up in your offices or hang up in each other's offices and throw darts at them <laughs> um but these are these are copies of a poster that will also go in each of our libraries the library in your district will have a copy of this same poster hung up in it uh, in, over the next few days. Um, and Commissioner Kyler, you get two of them because you have two libraries in your district. <laughs> was, so. he, was he showing teeth in his smile? Well, we'll be uh, able to see in a moment. Okay. So we thought maybe we'd give you all your posters this morning together. Okay. And we could take a picture with you if that's okay. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay. That's cool. Go down there. Matt will come out of the magic door and we'll take a picture. I'm sure. There we go. All right, so let's think. This two over there, just over here. And I'll take your side. I'll take the poster. I'll stay in a little bit. Okay, yeah, everybody needs to. There we go. Okay. Let's get one without, with just them first. That's okay. We have cheese. A little. A little. One more cheese hanging up. Did it go? I got it. Okay. It didn't, it didn't die altogether. One for Katie. Okay, if we get one, we'll just get there. Yeah. Okay. We can be hidden behind the There we go. Oh, perfect. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, wait. Thank you. Yeah, is what it, um, just for everyone here, it's um, the book of our choice. So everybody had their own book. I had a Colin Powell book. Um, and a stack. <laughs> books. Yeah, go figure. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I brought I brought the book about um, Lindy McNulty's book on farmers in Carroll County. Oh, there you go. And I thought it's mostly photos. I get criticized, but about half of the staff was at families in the book so <laughs> I, I lucked out okay what i'd like is um how about we get uh we have a proclamation on um 
uh, what is it, Older Americans Month, and just so happens Commissioner Kyler, there's no reason why he's reading it, but <laughs> just to let you know. Yes, uh, yes, yes. And I know... This um, is where you need a Commissioner Weaver. <laughs> just, you know. Commissioner Weaver is a few months older than I am. He is. Mm -hmm. Well, you spent the best three years of your life in third grade. That's right. <laughs> okay. Yep, we were together. Um, so, Celine, Rich, um, Gina, you want to come up here as Commissioner Kyler is reading, and then you can also share with us your thoughts and insight about Older Americans Month. Should I, uh, should I hold up Commissioner Kyler's read poster while he's no, reading? No, I think we'll be good. Ready? I'm ready. Older Americans Month, May 2023. Whereas the Carroll County Bureau of Aging and Disabilities has provided service to older adults in Carroll County since 1972, 51 years, and whereas as they grow older, adults continue to explore the wide range of experiences that help pave paths to fulfillment and independence. There is no right way to age and people should experience an array of activities without being boxed in by expectations and stereotypes. Did, did you hear that part? I got that. Okay. Um, the 2023 theme for Older Americans Month is Aging Unbound. This year's theme focuses on how older adults can celebrate, connect, and help build their communities in any way they feel comfortable. We invite all older adults to continue to cultivate aging their way by embracing opportunities to change, exploring ways to push beyond boundaries by trying creative ways to experience growth, joy, and positive energy in your community, discovering the rewards of growing older. With age comes knowledge, which provides insight and confidence to understand and experience the world more deeply. Continue to grow that knowledge through reading, listening, classes, and creative activities. Forming relationships and stay engaged in the community. Everyone benefits when older adults remain engaged, independent, and included in their communities. Form new relationships by volunteering, working, and mentoring. Invest time with people to discover deeper connections with family, friends, and other members of your local community. Engaging, remain involved and contribute to your community through work, volunteer, and or civic participation opportunities. And whereas, Carroll County includes a growing number of older Americans who contribute their time, wisdom, and experiences to our community. And whereas, Carroll County's communities benefit when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds have the opportunity to participate and live independently. And whereas the Care County Commissioners recognize the need to create a community that offers the services and supports older adults may need to make informed choices about how they want to age. And whereas the Carroll County Bureau of Aging and Disabilities will work with its partners to continue to build a better community for the county's older residents by not limiting our thinking about aging, combating stereotypes, emphasizing the many positive aspects of aging, encouraging older adults to push past traditional boundaries, embracing and the diversity of experiences and knowledge of communities older citizens. Now therefore we the Board of County Commissioners do hereby proclaim May to be Older Americans Month. We urge every resident of Carroll County to celebrate our older citizens, help create an inclusive society, <clears throat> and accept the challenge of flexible thinking around aging. Adopted this fourth May, this fourth day of May 2023, the Board of County Commissioners of Carroll County. Thank you. Um, it's important. I mean, uh, just share with you, my mom's 91. Um, she's very active. I think maybe because she drinks a glass of wine every night, but you know, she, uh, it's important, you know, to break down some of the stigmas, you know, that you're old and you're put in the corner. And, uh, you know, sometimes they want to be put in the corner, you got to pull them out, and then all of a sudden they become more active. I mean, Roberta, your mom just turned 94. And, uh, you know, again, take an opportunity. So it's important uh, for all of us to have programs that you provide. And uh, so, Rich, Gina, Celine, really appreciate all you're doing. Um, 
for our Carroll Countyans. But that's my point. Is there any thoughts? And we'll hand it off. Yeah, ladies, uh, Gina. Yeah, it's a, it's a great opportunity um, to recognize our older adults, um, the productive lives that they've led and continue to leave, um, their accomplishments, um, their contributions to our community. Um, it's, it's very important in our service delivery to make sure that our services are person-centered um, and that we respect self-determination um, and that we you know, design or, or provide services around the personal choices of the individuals that we serve because they know themselves best. And, um, you know, and while Older Americans Month recognizes our older adults for a specific period of time, I think it's important to recognize them every single day of the year. Oh, thanks. Rich? I, I would just add that, um, it, especially at the senior centers, um, I get the opportunity to um, spend some time talking to uh, the members there and some of the stories that they tell um, and their experiences are pretty amazing and um, you know that's just here in Carroll County and uh, you know um, trying to encourage people to share those experiences and um, with others as an opportunity to kind of inspire others to that they can do more um, and I think that's very important um, you know with that in mind at the senior centers we'll have um, special lunches um, to, to honor, um, to recognize Older Americans Month um, at uh, May 19th at Westminster and May 31st at the other centers. Um, but beyond that, we do, we, every day we try to come up with a variety of activities. Um, I will say if there was one thing that, um, that was good that came out of uh, the pandemic, it's that it kind of forced us to think a little differently about how we approach services. And I mean, hopefully we're getting better at um, recognizing um, opportunities to provide a, a wider variety of things. So thank you very much. Absolutely, Celine. And I, I wanted to say that, you know, Older Americans Month times up very nicely with us being in the process right now of creating a four year aging area, area aging plan for Carroll County. Um, and part of that is that we have a survey out right now, um, and we will put that out hopefully with our press release today with this um, proclamation with the link. It's open until Monday for folks to weigh in on what they feel the gaps and needs are in our community for aging services. And it's for anyone. It can be a professional in the field taking it, older adults, caregivers, um, people with disabilities, veterans. Please feel free to take that survey and give us your input. So this is a great time to recognize our, our older Americans. Um, and here in Carroll, like I've said a million times before, we cannot provide the services that we provide, especially at our senior centers, without the volunteerism of our seniors and older adults. They, they basically, I want to say they, they run our centers um, because their support there is, is phenomenal. Um, we have so many volunteers in every center, and the volunteer hours that they commit every year um, are instrumental in what we do um, and being able to provide the lunches. They help with lunches, front desk coverage, activities, decorations. Um, activity planning committees, so you name it, the site councils, they are involved. Um, and we always look to them for more opportunities that they want us to provide to, to keep them um, even more engaged, so. Oh, fantastic. And oh, you're right, when I, I'm sorry, Commissioner, oh. I apologize, were you? Nope. Well, I was just gonna say, you know, to, to your point, uh, when I had my uh, town hall a couple weeks ago, it was all senior citizens who were there setting chairs up, getting everything ready, getting everything uh, uh, set and ready to go. Um, and, and, you know, I really do take the point that Commissioner Rossi had, had raised earlier that, that, you know, at a certain point in history, you would get to a certain age and that you would be considered old. That would be the end of it, right? And at that point, it was best to just, like you said, sit in the corner and just be done with it. But that is certainly not the case anymore whatsoever. Um, I, I'm genuinely amazed by, especially people in this county who I meet, who are in their 80s and 90s, they're out working farms, or they're training horses, or they're, they're involved in, in various capacities and in you know, actual physical things, uh, in sports for that matter. Um, and, and I think it really is a blessing what you guys are able to do uh, for them and, and what they're able to do in, in return for our county. You know, it, it, you know, as we are aging, as, we, as our county's population does age, taking into account everybody. I mean, if we really want to be as inclusive as possible, that means taking into account the elders, the elderly generation as well. And, and one thing that, that you know, always irked me growing up, right, and I, I you know, really this, this mindset, this stigma is, is changing, 
you know, I would hear, you know, my friends who are like, oh, that person's old, their opinion doesn't matter, or, or they're, you know, they're old, what, 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 is, what do they count for anymore? And, and that would break my heart because, you know, you, you spend your life learning and understanding and growing in this kind of experiential wisdom, and you get to a point in your life where you're able to, to share some of that and to think that nobody wants to listen to what you've learned. I mean, that, that, that's heartbreaking. I mean, that, knowing that, that there are people who have that kind of knowledge and that wisdom and that understanding, I think that is a blessing. You know, we, it, it, it's kind of like with, uh, with birthdays, right? And I, I know I'm kind of going on a little bit here, but I really do think this is important. Uh, you know, a lot of people now just kind of like shrug off their birthdays. It's like, oh, I'm 40 or oh, I'm 50, who cares? But, but you go back a hundred years and it was, it was a blessing to live to be 50 to 60. And, and I think that, that, you know, age is something that we celebrate because it also reflects on the, the, the nature of our culture, our strength of our country, that we live in a place that is this wealthy and affluent and, and, and successful to be able to provide these, these futures for citizens. That are, that the expectation of life is as long as it is, and that, that really is a, a blessing. And so thank you for, for what you do to, to sustain that. Thank you. And thank you for all you do. And well, I, I haven't started doing either of these. The one thing I have learned in Carroll County, don't mess with bingo and don't mess with pickleball. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, you do it's a town true. hall and you're coming absolutely up on bingo. True. <laughs> so, absolutely. Anything else? Okay, why don't we get a, a picture with the proclamation. And Matt will come out the side. Back. Magic. Okay, Celine, you get to stay in the hot seat and let's uh, pull in a couple others and talk about the FY24 Community Development Block Grant application. Good morning, Commissioners. This is actually a public hearing on a uh, Community a Development uh, Block Grant application, and it's designed to support the uh, recovery housing project for the Westminster Rescue Mission. And this public hearing was advertised in the Carroll County Times on April 29th. 2023 and as you mentioned we have staff with us a director of citizen services our uh, the uh, I'm sorry Help me out. Uh, Stephanie Haley is here from the Westminster Rescue Mission and Deb Standiford our grants uh, office is here if you have any questions Stephanie did a great job this morning yes at the prayer breakfast thank you and it was I'll tell you it's it's so wonderful to go into a prayer breakfast and to see all of our <laughs> council members i mean that's that is a testament to the community so it was great to see you all there well you're a very strong testament to our community and what you shared was yes i felt one heartfelt very on target and uh very appreciative uh, i think amongst all of us so thank you thank you um so we went through the briefing already mm -hmm. uh once so now it's if there's been no comments we, we actually do have some comment cards. Oh, we do yes. on this. Okay. And, and I just want to, yeah, I'm sorry. I need, just need to add a couple of details before we open it for public comment. And we want to also share with you the property because we didn't have those details when we came before you okay. for the pre-approval. I, I apologize. Okay? If sorry. there are other public comments, if you can provide them to uh, Mr. Burke, that'd be great regarding this, this topic. Just this topic. Yeah, ju just this topic. So. 
Okay. All right. Good go morning. Ahead. So we are here not only for the public hearing this morning, but also for the application approval, the submission of the application. Um, I did want to mention that if um, someone wants to read the application prior to the submission, they can contact me, Carroll County Grants Office, um, here at 225 North Center Street. My phone number is 410-386-2212, and I can send a draft to them up through the 10th where when we will submit it um, we do have a sign-in sheet in the back so if anyone is here for the public hearing if they could make sure that they sign in prior to leaving we would appreciate it um, now Stephanie's just going to give you some detail an update on the project because as I said when we came before you for pre-approval we did not have the property yet mm -hmm. great so I believe in your briefing packet you have our PowerPoint um, so, no yes yes and so um, just a couple, just, just I, w I wanted to share with you just a little bit of a phrase from one of our letters of support. So since we were here last time, we went out and engaged with some of our community and you know wanted to make sure that our partners in the community were in, in favor of this. And not surprisingly, they are. Um, our own Sheriff DeWeese, um, Haven Shoemaker, Thomas Ledwell um, jointly provided a letter of support for us that I just want to share um, just a brief part of that. Throughout Carroll County and specifically the town of Westminster, the opioid crisis continues to be a pressing problem requiring strategic methods of prevention and education. County statistics show that since 2019, our county has seen over 3,000 overdoses and over 200 individuals have lost their lives due to this horrific crisis. Availability of recovery housing in Westminster for men far outweigh those for women who also suffer from substance use disorder. It's a definite need in Carroll County, Maryland. It's unfortunately um, definitely a need. And as you know, um, we are coming forward to um, find a property and we have found that and I'll share that with you today. Um, that provides an opportunity for women to continue to stay with their children while they're in recovery. Um, and this is temporary housing and we provide supports while we are helping women to find employment, um, to stay in, in recovery, um, and also to find permanent housing. So I'll share with you, um, I remember, I believe Commissioner Gordon, it was you that said, so what, what property are you looking for? Um, well, take a look at this beautiful property um, that we are now under contract on. So this is um, 327 Crowell Road. This is out 97, um, kind of off to the left, not far from Maryland Mallet. Um, if you know where that is, this is a 10 acre property. You see kind of the overview. Um, there are some buildings that aren't a part of the property, but um, there you see the house. Um, it has some outbuildings, lots of land and space. Um, and this is really a beautiful, um, a beautiful spot for what we're envisioning, which is gardening and small animals and outside activities and real family type environment, right? That is away from a lot of the stressors that come with closer living. Um, <clears throat> I just want to give you some highlights of the property. Um, there is sufficient space for a live-in house manager. So for us, um, when we do recovery housing, we absolutely will have a staff member living on site. Um, really, I think what we have experienced in our addiction programs and our recovery programs are that if we have if we provide the supports around people, it's much more um, effective and we're much more successful. Um, people can. Be be successful when they have the supports around them. So we will have a live-in house manager and we expect to be able to serve two to three women with their kids at a time. Um, and it all depends on how many kids they have and if it's a woman who's pregnant or depending on how many rooms there are. So in this particular house, um, the main house has three bedrooms, two and a half baths. There is an above garage apartment, one bedroom and a bath. Um, and then there's a separate uh, basement apartment with a bedroom and a bath and a separate kitchen. So there are multiple living areas um, for families. There, there are living areas for gathering, um, for study for kids or for play areas or just gathering um, to, to be together. Um, it's a safe environment with ample space inside and out for quality living. 
So you can see a few, I've included a few of the pictures, but there are lots of outside spaces for the kinds of things that, um, that we want to do and that we know are good um, in, in the healing process. I provided also in um, the PowerPoint just a, a visual of the way that we approach treatment, um, which is, you know, it, it's not just one thing um, that, that solves, um, th that helps people along in recovery. It's, it's medical health, it's spiritual support, it's case management, um, it's physical health, mental health recovery, peers um, who support and workforce development. All of those things go into helping people and that's what our staff um, can provide. Um, so you'll see that our plan is, um, is to provide housing, sufficient staffing. Because of our food program, we can also provide food supports um, and supportive services, including working with our community partners. And that's all to come up to, um, to be able to come to the outcomes for these women, um, the outcomes being sustained recovery, employment, um, and income, and permanent housing. <coughs> so I. So this is the this is the property that we're um, currently um, putting forward. We're really excited about it, and we would appreciate your support. If there are any questions, um, Deb said, you know, there's so you can certainly contact her, but also, of course, you can contact me. Happy to share more or answer questions. Okay. Any questions so far? Um, let me just make sure. Chris, is there anyone on the phone regarding this item? Let me check. I've got two callers that just jumped on. Let me see if they're calling about that item. Uh, caller three, uh, you are currently muted. If you use star six, uh, you can unmute yourself. Caller four, you're already unmuted. Are you calling about this item? No. Okay, thank you. I think that was a yes. Yeah, was, was that it? a yeah? I thought it was a no. <laughs> that was a no. I thought it was no. a no. It was a no. That was a no. Okay. okay. Oh, no. I thought it sounded yeah. like a yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. okay. It's good to put the it was S more on like yes. a no, no. Hey, we, we're good. Anyway, we do have two uh, speakers. The first one is Ryan Day. Could you please approach the microphone? And if we ask you to limit your comments to three minutes if you can. I will. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. I'm here in support of the Westminster Rescue Mission. I'm currently the engagement officer for the Westminster Rescue Mission, but two years ago I was a broken man with a devastating drinking problem. That was destroying my life. The Westminster Rescue Mission has helped me over the last two years work on the challenges of alcoholism and gave me a platform to start over. I graduated the nine-month program and have for the last year been living in their transitional sober housing. The Westminster Rescue Mission Transitional Housing has kept me plugged into the same staff that pushed me to keep going during the time on the program. Because of that love shown to me by the staff, today I have a, a job I love dearly, an incredible relationship with my two young daughters, and as of a week, as of this week, to a home to call my own in Carroll County for me and my beautiful daughters to call our own. All thanks to Stephanie Halley and the rest of what I now know as the fam my family at the Westminster Rescue Mission. Thanks for letting me speak. Thank you. Next is Alyssa Viquez. Hello. Um, I was a highly functioning addict and I had a professional job. I was a dedicated and loving mother to my son who was a toddler at the time. When I originally sought help, I chose a two-week program. It was all I could do at the time and also all I was willing to do at the time because I needed to be a present mother to my son. Two weeks obviously wouldn't be enough and in 2020 I was one of the first two women to begin the, the women's program at the Westminster Rescue Mission. I started the day after Mother's Day and the panic I felt was indescribable. I had only been away from my son for those two weeks, sorry, and the idea of being away for months was suffocating. I almost changed my mind about going but truly believed that God led me through the doors that morning. <laughs> I spent six months at the mission, and during that time, I only got to see my son a handful of times due to the stricter guidelines in place from COVID. We were able to speak on the phone every night, but it was the hardest thing I've ever experienced. 
I knew that to get better, I needed that time to work on myself, but it was always tugging at me that I was missing important moments with my son every day. I almost left a few times because of how much I missed him, but God kept me strong and knew he was cared for and brought me comfort. I had the privilege of having a safe place with a loving family to take care of my son while I was away. I know this opportunity to open a house for mothers and children would save the lives of other mothers like me who maybe don't have the same chance and or support that I did. The bond with their child and knowing exactly where they are and how they're doing will only embolden them to stay and continue treatment. It is a rare opportunity and one that I believe in. I am three years clean and sober and I'm the mother I always wanted to be. My six-year-old is thriving, and I just had another baby this February, and I owe it all to the Westminster Rescue Mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I don't um, say things often, but uh, I think my favorite verse is Joshua 1.9, strength and courage is always with us. Uh, or st strength and courage is there because we know God is always with us paraphrased um amen and she defined that very well in her own words um are there any other uh, comments mr burke uh we need a motion to close the public hearing motion to close the public hearing and approve the submission of the fy 24 cd bg application and accept the award second okay i have a motion i have a second any discussion so the uh, the property right now is being it looks like it's not a sort of a, a traditional residential home it looks like well, what is the current function so it is it is actually it is? a okay. residential home yes it? okay. it's a residential home and it will continue to be because yeah. there are different living spaces and even in the main house there are um, different bedrooms and different um, bathrooms so we can can still continue to use it yeah, residentially you know, it, it sort of looks like a nice compound if you will if, if that's what you're right I mean there's one house and but then there are a couple of um, outbuildings yeah okay. so I'm just curious is, mm, yeah and I'll just say very briefly to the the gentleman and the young woman who spoke thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing your stories this morning for having the courage and the conviction to do that and God bless both of you mm -hmm. thank you any oh. Please. I'll just echo that. I appreciate both of you coming in this morning and, and sharing that with us. Um, I think the one thing that when you, you came in initially and, and presented this that I found actually quite remarkable was, one, allowing the ability for children to stay with the mother. Because mm -hmm. we all know that's incredibly important. And I think at times that gets lost in the thought process of, of people needing assistance and help. Um, the other thing that really jumped out at me, and I, I really like if I can use that word fairly, I like the fact that this property is not, uh, I don't know, I guess surrounded by every other possible distraction or influence in the universe. It, it is a property like, you know, it, it very much feels, to your point, healing, uh, serene. You have the ability to be around people you need to be around, but you're also a a a aware and away from other things that may challenge you. So I, I commend you on that concept. I think that's quite exceptional. I've had some people personally, friends and family, that have contended with this issue, as we all have. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is just a, a really impressive concept in, in the way that you're approaching this. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to... Uh, Discussion decision to exercise option to purchase the Robert Nesbitt property through the Rural Legacy Program and then the Nicole Gasper and Mike Watson property through the Rural Legacy Program. Yes, good morning, Commissioners. We're here uh, uh, before you for a couple of properties uh, in our Rural Legacy Program. And I'm going to turn things over to Jackie to walk you through each of those. Sounds good. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is through our Rural Legacy Program, which is 100% funded by a state grant from DNR. Um, we have two Rural Legacy areas, Little Pipe Creek and Upper Patapsco. Um, they're done on a points-based appraisal valuation, and we can do small or large farms with this program. Um, our first uh, re review is the Nicole Gasper and Michael Watson property. 
Uh, it's located at 2702 Aspen Drive in Hampstead. 36.2121 acres. It has seven lot rights will be retiring. Um, the fair market value of the land came out to $299,334.89 per the points-based appraisal. Uh, it's going to cost us, two, the, through the grant, $209,534.43, which comes out to a little over 5700 an acre. Um, and that is 70% of that fair market value. Here is the property. <coughs> and here's how it fits with other easements in the area. I apologize. Go back to that one slide. This, this one? Yeah. So we still have some work to do mm -hmm. surrounding. How how are you feeling about the surrounding areas? There's things there that we can preserve. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just a matter of them coming to us. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So at this time we're requesting final approval uh, of the Nicole Gasper and Michael Watson property at a cost of $209,534.43. Okay, it's up in Hampstead. Is there a motion? It's actually the second piece of paper in your book, by the oh, way. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, just being. Yep. Oh. Where's this one? Oh, it's, it's in Westminster. Yeah, just oh, separate. sorry about that. You're second. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Did I get confused? No. No, okay. Yeah. Listen, I move the Board of Commissioners exercises the option to purchase a rural legacy program conservation easement on the Nicole Gasper and Michael Watson property. Second. Second. Okay, I got a motion, a couple seconds. Any discussion? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And our second property today is the Robin Nesbitt property. Um, it's located off of Borner Road in Westminster, which is off okay. of uh, 482. Uh, it's 32.177 acres, has six lot rights to retire. Uh, the fair market value came out to $228,323.51. The cost of 70% of that fair market value is $159,826.46, which is almost 5000 an acre. Here's the property, and here's how it fits with other easements in the area. So again, there's a lot there yeah, that still no potentially could come in. Any uh, close takers on that surrounding property? Not at the moment. Wow. Not at the moment. Okay. And so hmm. we're requesting final approval for the Robin Nesbitt property. 1237 Borner Road in Westminster at a cost of $159,826.46. Okay. Is there a motion? <clears throat> I, I move the Board of Commissioners exercises the option to purchase a Royal Legacy Program conservation easement on uh, Robin Nesbitt property. Second. Second. Okay, I got a motion. <laughs> I still have a couple of seconds, which helps. Any discussion? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Thank you. Absolutely. Very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. We're going to move on to text amendment referral to the Planning Commission for the allowance of restaurants in the agricultural zone. Now, um, do we have public comments on this topic? I believe we have. Yes, two. sir. I believe I've got three callers on the line. Okay. What I'd like is if there's public comment on this topic, if you can share your salmon color cards um, to Ms. Wyndham, I would appreciate that. And um, why don't we start with public comments and then go from there? Sure. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, do you want to start with the folks on the line? Yeah. So, Chris, if we can start with um, yeah. those on the line for this topic. I sure can. All right, can the first caller, Ms. Goggins, call? Uh, can you hit star six to unmute? And you'll have three minutes to make your public comment. All 
first caller. How about any caller? Just hit star six and you'll have three minutes, <laughs> one at a time. they don't want this topic. I don't know. Okay. Maybe they don't want this topic. I feel like, you know, in the Army we had this thing called SB22 switchboard and we I, uh, could plug, and plug it in. <laughs> so I had the opportunity to catch two of them when they first called in and they were calling about this specific item. Okay, uh, so well, maybe they'll come back in a, in a minute. Hey, we've got a, Fisher, we have a call already. Okay. Caller four, you're ready. You have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, my name is Terry McIntyre. I actually live on Pleasant Valley Road near the driving range, which I understand is an ag use property. And I am in full support of a restaurant on any agricultural properties in the county. I think that that can only add value and revenue to the county. I don't see any negatives at all where you serve alcohol to have food along with that as well. Um, I think the golf course and other ag properties will only draw people from other counties to come into our county to spend money in our town, and I believe that's a win-win for the local businesses as well as the county. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next caller, you are unmuted. If you could identify yourself, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dawn Geigen. I'm not sure if you can hear me. We can. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, I am absolutely in favor of um, having restaurants on agricultural land. I'm a lifelong resident of Carroll County. My mom is an original homeowner in Finksburg. We back up to a farm, um, grown up with farmland all around, and uh, my uncle, uh, my late uncle, had a farm at uh, off of Tyrone Road. And uh, it's something that is a really, really hard life. And if we can use their products, their produce, and turn that into like a great eating, uh, dining type of restaurant experience, I think it would be great. Um, the outdoor venues, I think, are fantastic. Um, I thought Island Green handled it about the best I saw during COVID with their um, ability to space out uh, family friendly event um, events there uh, we would take our grandchildren there to go putt putt and it's nice to be able to get a bite to eat with the kids afterwards and support like local places I mean like uh, Ballgers that type of place has their own farm in one spot but it'd be nice to tie it all together where you can go to like wineries or do outdoor venues like um, playing golf and uh, listening to some music I currently back up to what used to be the old golf course and they would have music out there and it was it was so nice to sit out on the deck and hear um, like the music from a wedding or something like that and hear the laughter and hear hear the um, guys golfing because somebody landed one in the pond and you know that kind of stuff I, I enjoy just hearing Carroll County life um, I'm all about giving back to our farmers that work so hard and I think that it would help them to have the ability to serve their stuff in restaurants. Um, for those of you that might have met me a few years ago, uh, we had a pro proclamation uh, back in 2017, October. Um, I'm all about the military. I'm a Marine mom. I run a nonprofit that gives back to our military. You can meet us. We will be at the Veterans Celebration on Saturday. It's America's Warriors. We'll be back by the Hoff Barn. I'd love to talk to anybody else about supporting our veterans and supporting our farmers and let's bring people in to support our farmers our town instead of going into <clears throat> other neighborhoods it's a win-win for our locals okay thank you and i'm hoping you're going to be there on sunday and not saturday as the veterans event is oh sunday. yes sunday <laughs> yes it's all good no actually i've got two two things going on saturday we're going to be sending out about 120 cases of Girl Scout cookies out of the Tawny Town Post Office. They actually stay open late for us to facilitate, and then we will be back out on um, Sunday for that event. So it's a busy weekend for me. That sounds good, and maybe Commissioner Vigliotti will buy us a case of Girl Scout cookies to share, but that's a different story <laughs> for a different time. We, we may have to take a vote on that one. Um, <laughs> any, uh, oh, thank you, ma'am. 
Okay, Chris, anyone else? There is one more caller, caller three. If you're calling for this item, could you please use star six on your cell phone or home phone there and uh, you'll have three minutes. Please identify yourself. Thank you. Caller three, are you there? They're either not calling about this uh, item okay. or they're they've they're not there for us. No, nope, that's Thanks. all. It's all good. Uh, Miss Wyndham, would you like to? Uh... First card is Brooke Haggerty. Hello, uh, my name is Brooke Haggerty. My husband Ken Laurie and I are both uh, we both own businesses in Carroll County. We have done work with uh, Island Green in the past. Uh, they are a, a definitely an added value to small businesses in and around Carroll County. As restaurant owners, we know how difficult it is to get people in. We are in, out in the middle of nowhere, and we pull the majority of our, I shouldn't say the majority, but many of our guests come from across the line in Pennsylvania. Um, the proximity of the Island Green uh, location also allows for people to come from Frederick County, from Pennsylvania, from other counties and, and, and other states to help support Carroll County. We are in full agreement with, um, ag with farms being able to be restaurants. We support small business. We support restaurants coming in to Carroll County. The more businesses that we can get in here while still preserving a lot of the farmland that we need, but we need the value added. Um, I'm also a farmer's market manager here in downtown Westminster. We, we live and die by value added right now. The more value we can bring to the properties that are in Carroll County to bring more guests into our county to um, make it even better, it, it, this is a it's a win-win situation for everyone. The people at Island Green have done everything that they can mm -hmm. to make sure that everyone is taken care of in the most accommodating of manners. And they're not the first ones to have food at a, at a farm facility. There's many other places that do that in Carroll County, and we are in support of all of that for not just Island Green, but for any other farm establishments that want to bring in that value added of the restaurant slash and or liquor, wine, beer sales. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Doug Weatheralds. Hi, my name is Doug Weatherholtz. Let me get my notes here out. Sorry. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, say that restaurants on ag zone lands can provide numerous benefits for farmers, business owners, and restaurant patrons. Here's just a few reasons why restaurants on ag zone lands can be good for Carroll County's agritourism. Fresh local ingredients by having restaurants on ag zone lands shall have easy access to the freshest, most flavorful ingredients. Experts will agree that this equals higher quality food for guests. An added benefit for the farmers is that, is that, that they can reduce their own food costs and waste in addition to maximizing in their earning potential on their own farms. Support for local agriculture. By patronizing restaurants in ag zone lands, guests are supporting local agriculture and keeping money in Carroll County and not the neighboring counties or states. Uh, ag zone areas are great for recreational use. Uh, I think COVID-19 pointed that out, uh, and I think it's carried over them. People like to be outside now. It's not the just sit inside a restaurant and eat. People want to be outside and doing activities. In ag zone lands, as you know, Carroll County is about 80% ag zoned, so we have a large amount of land for this to take place. Uh, such activities are golf courses, driving ranges, parks, camps, campgrounds, perhaps even a dinosaur park one day, and of course, uh, live music venues. All these could have added value with a restaurant on those properties. Uh, obviously, the big thing is a boost to the local economy. By attracting more visitors to the area, restaurants on the Ag Zone lands can help boost Carroll County's economy, create new job, new job opportunities, and raise property values as well. Overall, I'd just like to say having restaurants on Ag Zone lands could be a win-win situation. I know we've heard that term a few times today. Uh, for Ag Zone owners, restaurants and guests alike and of course Carroll County agritourism which I'd like to see uh, be expanded to this area 
and people come in from the outside and just enjoy our great county, the beautiful views, uh, the great food, uh, the great meats that this uh, county produces, and um, I'd love to see that take place. Thank you. Next, Richard Krause. Yes, Richard Krause. And uh, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, my disapproval of uh, having restaurants and bars on agricultural land. The, um, the code of ordinances today is quite clear. Eating and drinking establishments are not allowed. And uh, obviously, um, Carroll County is a primarily ag um, uh, county. I'd like to keep it that way, in all honesty. Uh, if I was, uh, you know, the, to have a, a bar and a restaurant on a, a piece of ag property adjacent to my property reduces my property values. It has to. If I was looking to buy a piece of land, a piece of land or a house adjacent to a bar and restaurant, <coughs> I would go to a city where, where that would be more more allowed, not in the Carroll County area where it's all agricultural. So I see little benefit in having, in having that uh, ability to uh, have a farmer uh, say, well, I can make more money selling beer, wine, liquor, uh, and, and food than I can growing corn. And that's, a, that's probably a true statement in all honesty. <clears throat> but this is zoned agricultural, and it should remain agricultural. <clears throat> as, these, as these properties are converted to non-agricultural um, use, putting restaurants and bars on it, what's to prevent the restaurant and bar from expanding, getting larger and larger, expanding their hours, a, a bar can close at 2 a.m. Um, I don't need that in my community. So I see little benefit to the community in allowing that to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Greg Fullerton. Good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Fullerton. Uh, I also live on Pleasant Valley Road. I love Carroll County. I've been uh, here most of my life. I'm a former Marine Corps veteran, uh, firefighter. I was injured on a job. I will suffer from pain for the rest of my life because of it. I, I, like, like Commissioner Kyler had mentioned, this is the greatest county to live in. For a county that wants to conserve agricultural so bad, they sure do want to give away agricultural so bad. I don't understand how they want to put restaurants and venues on agriculture so much, why yet mentioning they want to preserve it. It makes no sense to me. It's a shortcut to put a business on agricultural, and I am a business owner also. It's a shortcut to shortcut all the commercial things that you have to do to have a business just to say, okay, we're going to throw it on ag. There's no uh, traffic studies. There's no limits to people. It, it seems like it's completely uh, almost lawless, I would say. Uh, what people don't seem to realize is if you approve a restaurant on an agricultural property, there's accessories of use to this restaurant, which, like everybody's admitted, talked about, Island Green, concerts, thousands of people, people drinking, pouring into your neighborhoods, the safety of it the trash in your yards, the music, the noise, it's outrageous. You can never open your windows on a nice day from May to October. You will hear rock concerts or country concerts or whatever the venue is. It's beyond outrageous. I would never think of moving to the country, which is why I would say 90% of us live in Carroll County. We want to buy out in the agricultural district. I support farmers, farmers farm. Farmers don't have concerts and wineries and breweries. This is what farmers do, they farm. So to say that farmers are doing this is outrageous also. All businesses that are doing this legitimately in town and paying for commercial property and the expenses that are going through the plan zoning site plan and all these different things should be outraged that this is even a possibility. Any bar, restaurant, grill should be furious that this is even considered uh, here and homeowners should be extremely nervous. I have three sides of my property. It's on agricultural So will I have three more winery brewery bars on each side of my property 
I mean, it's gonna, it will make it so you have to leave Carroll County. The people, the residents of Carroll County don't understand the impact that this is going to have. I sleep terrible at night, so sometimes I try to sleep during the day. You cannot. It's outrageous. Uh, if you need a rezoning program, I would say get some kind of rezoning program. And because uh, Mr. Weatherholtz here is he's the manager of Island Green, as Commissioner Vigliotti knows, I spoke at his town hall last week, and this is what Mr. Weatherholtz posted of me online to incite violence against myself and my family. I have plenty of trash in my yard now, daily, because of what Mr. Weatherholtz posted on his web, his web page, not only his web page, but Westminster Online Community Group. He posted this of me. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I believe I have one more. I, you didn't indicate, ma'am. Oh, you didn't indicate what you wanted to speak about. Was it this topic or yeah, something else? Topic. Okay, then I may have two more. No, it's a point, and then I just wanted to ask. <laughs> That's fine. Um, uh, Tim Craig, is it this topic also? Okay. okay. Morning, Tim Craig. Um, I rise to oppose the uh, the, the text amendment. Um, we live on two family farms. My father-in-law is also here with us this morning. We have. Uh, unfortunately, one of them does border Old Westminster Winery. Um, they have turned a field of 17 acres, which was largely in a wetlands, um, into basically a nightclub slash tavern with, and, and my understanding was they were permitted to have 50 people per weekend, and now it's thousands. Uh, we attended a hearing recently downstairs in this building where 10 agencies uh, 10 agencies representing the county each had at least one violation that they found old westminster winery in violation of and still nothing has yet to, to occur so zoning as it applies to what we are loosely calling agribusiness today um, it, it's way too loosely applied this stuff has nothing to do with farming I love golf. I've been to Island Green. I didn't know it was an ag. It was it was on ag land. Um, the, these these businesses have nothing to do with agriculture whatsoever. They've turned into just absolute monsters where there's just field parties and revelry all night long. Uh, Mr. Rothstein, you'll remember I, I think that I was a part of the um, the, the the building of a huge building down there at St. Stephen's Reformed Episcopal Church a few years ago. Because it's a church building, we had to go through all of the local infrastructure rules and we had to build roads, turn lanes, all that good stuff. And as good citizens, we absorb those costs. When you're zoned for a business or a church or a school, you have to incur the cost of infrastructure that supports the business that supports the business school or institution that you're creating. These bars and restaurants in the middle of fields are not being asked to do that when they're on ag land. And to that end, the roads and the infrastructures locally are not set up to deal with the huge crowds, um, the, the traffic or any of the other things. Secondly, the quality of life. I think Mr. Fullerton probably covered that better than anything else. The large crowds, the traffic, the noise, um, all of these things have nothing to do with farming. And farmers don't support this. So at the very, ask, at the very least, I would ask that you, uh, if you're not comfortable voting against it, maybe delay this thing until we can talk to some of the local farmers about how this is going. This hearing, um, I found out about it just one or two days ago. I didn't know that it was going on. I think that we can fill this place with farmers and your parking lot with John Deere's saying, no, these things are not agribusiness. They have nothing to do with agriculture whatsoever. And finally, the environmental impact, the wells and septics in these areas are not designed for these huge crowds. Thank you, and I believe Thank the you. last comment um, I have I think the others I have are for the next item but if I'm wrong let me know um, is Natalie Mullinex hi my name is Natalie Mullinex I wasn't gonna speak but then I decided to, to just um, and I found out yesterday so I apologize but Island Green I thought it's um, commercial industrial under 158 isn't it it's not totally ag is it that 30 some acres 
Because it's showing up as commercial industrial, so I just have to dig in and figure out why it's showing that way then. It does show up. If you pull the tax record, it shows commercial industrial. Oh. Tax and then you have another? SDAT is different from zoning. You got the other one? SDAT yeah, but it, what? no, I'm not looking at SDAT, though. I'm also looking at zoning. But I'll dig into that and figure out why. And then you have the codes 158. Again, I'm, I'm here late, so I apologize. Um, I do agree that they should be able to post. Do um, I agree with both sides as far as I understand the un concern about having it in your backyard. But I do think that we should have um, allow this on agricultural property. So what's going on today? I think we should. But from what I'm noticing, th we do have zoning no um, ordinances for time limits, like 10 o'clock at night. So if they have the parties there, the bands there, they quit at a certain time at night. There's a lot of that, this infrastructure that is put in, and the builders put in the infrastructure for the other properties, not the farm people, but I mean, not specifically farmers. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. So I'll dig in more about that, because it is coming up commercial industrial. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there should be a win-win. I don't think anybody here or anyone that I've talked to that wants um, this to move forward wants to do it with parties till 2 o'clock in the morning or all night long and trash, et cetera. I think they want to, they're doing it within reason, you know. So that's all I had to say. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, one more time, Chris. Is there anyone else on? Yeah, there is a new caller. Caller 7, you are unmuted. If, if you're calling about this item, you'll have three minutes. Please identify yourself. Thank you. Caller 7, you're unmuted. Five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. Sorry, Commissioner. Okay, no, don't be. Um, Oh, good. No one else out here for this topic? Okay. Linda, Chris? Hi. All right. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are here for a text amendment referral. And just to be clear, this is not a hearing. No decisions are being made today. The only decision that we're asking for this body is to refer the Agricultural Zoning District for a text amendment for this specific um, area. Uh, so basically, uh, the nexus of this was this past year, the General Assembly passed legislation allowing certain types of food services, uh, certain types of food service as part of the winery and brewery class liquor license. Prior to this, winery and brewery under their class liquor license could not serve food that was prepared on site. You could serve pre prepared things, mm -hmm. but now the state law is allowing this. So, in order to track with state law, we're recommending that we um, review our agricultural zoning district um, for this type of allowance. Um, as well as there's been a lot of discussion about this being a accessory type use to um, our golf courses and driving ranges throughout the county. Um, so we wanted to have this discussion with you today and get your thoughts on referring uh, the agricultural district specifically pertaining to um, the restaurant allowance. Um, and I would even suggest narrowing it down further, maybe looking at as um, an accessory use to the winery, brewery, um, distillery on Agland, and uh, perhaps the golf course driving range specifically on Agland. Okay. So not opening up to the entire ag set, unless that's what you would like to do. Okay. Um, comments? Did you, oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. But, oh, okay. So I, uh, th this is something that I've been quite interested in since uh, before becoming commissioner. Uh, you know, a number of business owners have reached out to me regarding whether or not we might expand uh, certain uses of, of land in agriculturally zoned areas for the the diversification of the income that they generated through their businesses. Um, and then, of course, interestingly enough, through the uh, discussion that we had on the solar moratorium, uh, I ran. I did meet with a number of farmers, uh, either through email or in person, who uh, who told me that uh, uh, they would really, really prefer, or not prefer, but they would appreciate the opportunity to diversify the kind of income they were generating through the use of their farms. Um, that you know, obviously, farming is very difficult these days. That they are uh, you know, suffering from a number of different issues. Uh, everything from inflation to the markets. And these are people who want to continue to farm. They want to be able to, to generate the income to keep their farms. 
Um, and one of the, you know, any number of the suggestions I heard were, you know, for example, maybe a, a small restaurant. You're not talking about like a McDonald's or something. You're talking about something on the smaller side. Um, but also being able to, to use the products that they grow from the land. And in that case, uh, you know, certainly a winery would, would fall under that if they were producing the, the grapes to create the vintage products on their property. Um, and then also at the same time, uh, and I mentioned this the other day at my uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, town hall or uh, meeting, uh, you know, there is a very historical element to this as well. So if you go back, you know, several thousand years to ancient Greece, the development of the middle class came through the agrarian use of property, where, for example, if you were an olive farmer, if you grew olives, you weren't just selling olives to some company to turn into something else. Uh, you as an olive farmer uh, were personally taking that olive and you were refining it either into uh, uh, oil for, uh, for the uh, protection of military shields, you're turning it into uh, lubricant for uh, uh, wagon wheels for cart wheels, or you were turning it into olive oil for use in, in cooking and in other products. And what that did was that enabled farmers in ancient Greece to be able to be independent of both reliance on the government and also uh, being able to be self-subsistent. And I think that, again, all the commentary that, that I've received uh, over the course of the last couple months is that, you know, farmers do want to find ways to diversify their income. Um, and it's interesting to me, at least, that if we're looking toward the future and ensuring that, you know, we don't just have land that is agriculturally preserved, but land that is being actively used in an agricultural fashion, whether it is, you know, with livestock, with crops, or, or in certain cases, you know, with grapes. Um, you know, it, it being able to adapt to changing circumstances while preserving the best of what we have uh, and referring this to the Planning Commission, I think, is, is the way to proceed. Um, you know, as the one uh, lady here mentioned, uh, you made a very good point that there are certainly points on both sides that I think we can address, right? And talking about maybe not being open so late at night or, you know, whatever the case may be, but also at the same time, uh, you know, allowing farmers the opportunity if they have, if they meet certain requirements to, to diversify the income that they generate. So, Commissioner, just to be clear, I just want to make sure that you do understand that food processing and packing of agricultural products are a primary principal use on the ag land. So, just so you know, like the olive oil example, they can do that. Oh, I, I, okay. Right. I, I was just want to make I'm sure like, the restaurants are going to permit them to do that. They can already do that. Okay. Oh no, no. I was just bringing that up as an example from gotcha. from an historical aspect that that you know, the idea of having self reliant farmers mm -hmm. based on what they want to do with their property. Gotcha. That is actually agricultural. Yeah. Uh, before I make a comment, I, I first want to address one of the speakers earlier. It was an issue with a post and a picture of somebody. I, I, I really hope that's not going on. Well, if, it, it, if it is, that's not how we do things in Carroll County. That is not Carroll County. We called our place anarchy. I just, I just hope that's not happening. You said okay. we were full of drunks. I just hope that's not happening. Sir, I, did not. Um, I just feel the need to address that. We sit up here as as supposed leaders of the county and I'm personally not okay with it uh, so for those of you who have spoken in opposition to this uh, it's important for you to know that this Board of Carroll County Commissioners hears you uh, Commissioner Vigliotti mentioned what happened with the solar moratorium uh, I would encourage you to go back and take a look at that but we got into office took a look at that text amendment decided unanimously that it was not adequate it did not protect residents it did not protect farmland it did not protect the values of this county did not protect the look of the county and we created a six-month moratorium so i think it's fair to say that this board has gotten pretty good with text amendments and understanding what they are uh, the text amendment is an opportunity to create restrictions and it'll be interesting to see what comes back obviously from the planning and zoning commission because i see both of you writing writing all these concerns down so the process will be it goes to the Planning and Zoning Commission, comes back as a text amendment that we could approve, disapprove, or send back for, for continued tweaking. But I know I can speak for myself and probably everybody else here, we're extremely sensitive to this issue now because we've already been through it with the previous text amendment. When it comes back to us, though, I'm curious. I mean, do we have any idea, would this look like a conditional use, a still an accessory use in the ag? I mean, do we, or is that just for the Planning and Zoning Commission to, to even decide that, which is a pretty broad, important part So a part couple of this. things. So when we did um, the Agricultural Conservation Zoning District revisions that were just adopted in December of 2022, 
we stood up an agricultural work group for six months. We had um, participants, actually Kevin Addix, who is now the Secretary of Agriculture, was part of that group representing um, the value-added agricultural industry, um, as well as the Farm Bureau, Soil Conservation District, Health Department, Ag Preservation, Development Review. So we brought in a very diverse group of people. We met. Um, sometimes twice a month for six months to kind of go over this specifically. Um, the idea was then to come up with recommendations looking at emerging trends. One of the emerging trends is we actually had this discussion specifically about restaurants in the agricultural zoning district. At that time, the group and its composition and who they represented were not furthering this. So they were not interested in making this go further um, and having that as a principal use. Um, we threw out ideas such as an agricultural commercial overlay district that if you met certain parameters, um, perhaps this would be an allowance of something like that. Because again, these are our ag zones. Um, infrastructure is very, very limited. And even in terms of roadways, water usage is heavy with a restaurant, um, disposal of waste, grease, things like that, present challenges when you're away from the um, you know, infrastructure requirements that one might need. So we took a lot of that into consideration. That's not to say that we can't address it today and there's been some changes. So uh, I was just gonna say, to be uh, just a little bit more direct to your question is recommendations were brought back to the Board of County Commissioners and the Board of County Commissioners made the decisions. So, because your question was how the process, it'll come back to us yeah. in decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A absolutely, and so that's what uh, we would yeah, do. Yeah, I understand that. So I'm giving you a little bit of the history here, maybe a little too much, but before you go and make this decision, I want to let you know a lot of this has been discussed and considered over the last year or so. So then what comes out of today, whatever your decision is, if you send it to Planning Commission, we will have the same discussions again as we did with the original forwarding of the agricultural conservation code revisions to the board last year we will go ahead and look at those issues again and they will come up with recommendations or say we think things are fine and that's the recommendation it will come back to this body you don't need to send it back to planning commission again they'll come up with the recommendation you can choose to accept it or change it and i would suggest as we've done before is have specific work sections with the board of county commissioners to say Here's what happened again. Here are the discussions. Here are the comments. What direction do you want to go? So yeah. you will have the ultimate decision. Yeah, I, I think that would be helpful. Um, and, uh, and, and so I hope everybody, whether you're here in opposition or not, understands that process. And I think, I think if you're associated with Alan Green, you've got to understand that process as well. I mean, some really good points were brought up here, whether it's traffic or, or so on and so forth. And that text amendment, when it comes back to us, hopefully it's, some, uh, it's a, something we can take a look at and uh, it addresses some of those concerns but we may still decide that it's not adequate as, like as you just mentioned so just want to make sure everybody understands that and everybody here for the next issue understands that as well any other questions or comments a couple quick comments um, first and foremost anybody that lives in this county knows it's a balancing act we can't be completely one way on one topic versus another it's it's, it's very it's something we just have to be very um, judicious about when we balance everything whether it be ag whether it be commercial and I think that's something that everybody on all sides of an issue have to keep in mind um, ironically if you travel the country enough, what do you see? You see farm to table, you hear about you know, agro-tourism, value added. And I've done this over the past, I don't know, eight years, and I kept looking and I kept coming back here where I've grown up, I, I own a farm here, and I went, wow, why don't we do this? I mean, we've got so much ag in this community, but yet the rest of the world, or the rest of the country seems to act like this is a new concept, but we don't really totally embrace that here, and I find that really intriguing, and I have for a number of years. Now, that's not to say open the floodgates and let anything happen. There's, there's a balance. There has to be a balance to everything. Um, I guess my one question this morning to both of you is, uh, in, with the 2023 20, General Assembly passing this legislation, would we not have to, in some case, follow that legislation? We can't complete. Typically, we can't be more restrictive. I guess my question is: Is that a case of that, or or is that something totally different? Actually, we can we can be more restrictive. Okay. Yes, we can't be less. Restrictive. That's right. I'm sorry. You're yes. correct. Yes. Um, I think the reality is, you know, to Commissioner Vigliotti's point um, and a couple of my colleagues, yes, farming is different. That doesn't mean that everything we're talking about theoretically is farming. But I think we have to look 
wisely at how we utilize agricultural land both for the farmers as well as business and I think we do need to be looking at these other areas and asking ourselves is there a way to do both properly um, then I appreciate everybody for coming out this morning any other comments um, yes just briefly and you mentioned um, secretary addicts that I think we're gonna see well let me back up I think prior to this there were definitely some gray areas in the state law I think sometimes misinterpreted sometimes we were more strict and my opinion shouldn't have been and I think he's gonna try to clarify some of this and this session was the first mm -hmm. for the whole new mm -hmm governor and and secretary so i think we may see more of this and and i look forward to it and and i do think um this is a uh, a pretty proper use of of ag and and the one the one public comment we got that some of these properties are actually zoned commercial or anything other than ag is that correct I'm going to check into it because you would know best, but I'm just going by. Yeah, I was, I'm we're, sorry. We're I was to... asking these oh, people. Okay. Public comment's over. Yeah. Well, if it's a commercial or industrial, we wouldn't, they would not be part of this discussion. Whether it seems like it's open land or they're farming it now could still be zoned commercial or industrial. Um, so, you know, we would check on Island Green, but I'm 99.9% .9 mm -hmm. sure it's agriculturally zoned. But okay. we'll double check to see yeah, and well, clarify. With, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The... Um, yeah, you know, I think what was shared, um, another word is consistency. Ensuring that we have consistency across the county, you know, because it's very difficult to, and we're gonna get into the next topic as well, that um, you gotta be careful what you ask for, <laughs> because, you know, you may want, you may not want one thing, but then what could be the outcome can be something much less desirable in an area. Uh, so being as prescriptive as we'd like, understanding that this is not going to change zoning laws and ordinances every year, or every situation, you know, um, we, we need to have consistency uh, in our approach. And we did that. And I was very proud of uh, the work the last board and the planning commission and the work groups did in trying and working hard to maintain that consistency. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure how many golf courses and ranges there are in Carroll County. There's not many. Um, you know, a lot of discussion was about Island Greens in one location. Um, but again, we got to look at the entire county and all of the properties that we're, that we're talking about, not Island Green <coughs> by itself. Um, the, uh, you know, a couple of things about the General Assembly allowing certain types of food services, you know, specifically how is that defined? Mm -hmm. You know, that's just kind of a ambiguous type of mm -hmm. certain types. Well, um, making sure that how that's defined. Um, explore allowances in this use in a limited capacity, same you know that needs to be defined what is limited capacity um, just like we do with other you know activities and again we're going to get into this you know uh, bulk requirements you know heights and widths and all that kind of stuff we did that when people said well they're not defined no they are defined they may not be defined as well as we want them to be or in this specific case but they are that's what we got to make sure that uh, we are consistent um, the way we're going to get it right is, Linda, like you said, the work groups, they really do well. And um, the last one we did with uh, Secretary Addicts at that time, um, and that six months, I mean, there was a lot of work that was done, so I applaud everyone that participated in that. Um, a lot of good points were brought up. You know, it was very interesting because when the public comments, it was like, Everybody was in favor, then all of a sudden it switched to now everybody's not in favor. So it was like half and half, you know, and somebody had a dividing line. Um, so, uh, but a lot of interesting comments about agribusiness, infrastructure, quality of life. You know, what do we want this to look like? I mean, we were pretty animate about solar, you know, solar 
is not very intrusive, you know, um, except for the community and having these solar fields. But, uh, but as far as the activity itself is not, it's very passive. Um, so we just want to make sure we're consistent in how we are, I believe, recognizing what does agriculture mean to Carroll County? What does agriculture or agribusiness? What does the agricultural community mean to Carroll County? And this has to be consistent with all these other decisions. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think going back to uh, planning and zoning, I mean, I'm not sure why we wouldn't do that, you know, and that's really what you're asking for. There's no real decision except to take what the legislation shared, you know, mm -hmm. and now with the comments you heard from the community and you'll continue to hear from the community and from us, you know, um, come up with a path forward and that may be a work group to help go through this, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, on, on you guys. Um, so, um, accessory use was interesting, you used, because um, that may be a potential, mm -hmm. you know. I just, the last thing is, I mean, we have this vision sometimes of, you know, a Mark Twain type of community, this, this, or what's there, whoever the painter is, Norman Rockwell type of paintings. Well, it's good in one area, but it's not realistic for the entire county. We're moving forward, you know, in a lot of things. And um, I don't want to overcrowd ourselves, but I also want to ensure that we are doing the things necessary to keep ourselves relevant, quality of life, safe and secure, and the best education possible. So, um, okay. Is there any, are there any other discussion or a motion at this time for this action? Motion to forward the proposed zoning text amendment to the Planning and Zoning Commission for their review and recommendation. Second. I got a motion, I got a second. Any further discussion? Yeah. Yes, yes please. Ju just a touch. Um, one, we're not making a decision today, one way or the other. We are saying, let's get the facts so we can make a decision. And, and I want everybody to understand that. And then several times with these different properties, we've had questions on zoning. Um, can, can you share with whoever's listening that anytime anybody wants, they're welcome to contact and verify zoning? And how yes. do they do that? Um, we have it online. Uh, they can call the planning office. They can call the zoning administrator, and we can verify what the zoning is of a particular property. What frequently gets confused and, mm -hmm. and um, is that um, the zoning is the what you can determines what you can do on the property but it is not relevant to how you're taxed so if you look at things like the state department of assessments and taxation they may consider your property commercial for example even though it is zoned agricultural because you have a commercial use on it so that's where that disconnect it comes is in that's why yeah, yeah and, it's confusing. But I, I just want to clarify, mm -hmm. you can get a firm answer on it because Absolutely. Uh, it, it's tough to look places and uh, assume stuff. Mm -hmm. for, for the for the sake of getting getting the planning and zoning commission off on the off on the right track, I, I, can we can we all agree that accessory use or approved is probably not where this is going? Can we give you that sort of? Um, starting point as the board or I don't even know is that a support for this or not but you can now just to be clear an accessory use then um, if you wanted to have additional controls on something an accessory use would not necessarily give that to you that's, because that's why I'm yeah it's it secondary to the primary principal right. use that's so if you make changes to that accessory yeah. I mean there's no additional considerations when that accessory is done conditional use though could go through the Board of Zoning Appeals, and that could apply those conditions beyond what the ordinance says for hours of operation, how many events you can have a year, that sort of thing. That, that's why I'm making that suggestion, but I don't know if the board wants to go that far or not. But I mean, certainly not approved, and but as far as I'm concerned, accessory goes too far as well. But I, so by approved, just to be clear, you mean principal permitted, right? Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Oh. 
So I'm, I think I'm happy if they come back with maybe even some options okay. and sure. let them. But but I think it's a good point. But I think, mm -hmm. uh, sure. like you say, like you just clarified on accessory use versus conditional use, uh, come back with some options and try to make it not confusing to us. <laughs> Do okay. our best. So <laughs> for, first question is, like, do you want to pursue what you're asking? Because if so, because no, we got motion. No, okay. It sounds okay. like the board wants okay. to give the okay. Planning and Zoning Commission okay. yeah. some some breadth there okay. to do and, what they and they heard us. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we do have a motion and a second, and that's why I was asking if we want I to. I appreciate that, though. Thank you. We have a motion, second. Any further discussion on this action? Really appreciate. Really appreciate the uh, community's input uh, and continued input on this topic. All in favor? All right. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Going on to the second topic, text amendment referral to the Planning Commission to review self-storage bulk requirements in the commercial zoning districts. Um, I expect there's some salmon cards, but also, um, Chris, is there anyone on the phone right now? Uh, just Ms. Geigen, who spoke at the last uh, item. Is he somebody that wants to speak at this item as well or no? Let's find out. Ms. Geigen, are you making comment on this next item? Star six to unmute. Five, four, three, two, one. No, sir. Thank okay, you. maybe just a listener. Okay, everyone, if you have not yet, please fill out your salmon cards. Ms. Roberta, why don't you start it off? Alexandra Votol, if I pronounced your name correctly, I hope. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, my name is Alex Votol from the law office of G. Macy Nelson, and today I'm representing Nancy and Joe Lynch, who also are going to be speaking. Uh, my clients are really concerned about the rise of self-storage facilities across this county because these uses are not appropriate next to residential properties. They have very significant impacts. Uh, they cannot be easily converted to other uses after they're, being, they're done being used as storage facilities. Um, but under the current, co current Carroll County Zoning Ordinance, they are permitted by right in the C2 and C3 zone, which are often or in many circumstances located directly adjacent to residential properties. So as this commission considers or the planning department considers regulating these uses, my clients strongly suggest that the commission consider um, imposing a prohibition of these uses when they're located on properties directly adjacent to residential properties. And I'm not sure if the commission is aware, but Prince George's County has also um, recently passed a tax amendment that does something very similar. And I have um, printouts of that if you're interested in looking at them. But what it does is it, it maintains the existing zoning, so it allows these uses in the same zones mm -hmm. um, that currently exist, but then adds if the land proposed for these uses is directly adjacent to a residential use, that they would be prohibited. Um, we strongly suggest adopting that kind of regulation, but uh, to the commissioner's points that they've made several times, you all are put in a position to, you know, really balance interests, both the developer's interest in using their land with a reasonable use, but also residents' interest in having quiet enjoyment of their property. So if the commission's not comfortable at this time suggesting a prohibition of these uses, we suggest considering a moratorium like you did with the solar issue to really study the issue and be able to properly balance the interests um, at issue here. Uh, so we're really excited that you took up this issue and we are really looking forward to see what you do. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Alex. Um, a couple of real quick things. Well, again, the law firm? That uh, you G. Macy Nelson. Okay. Um, of the law if you, of, yeah. If you have hard copies of the Prince yeah. George, I mean, I have it on my phone uh, here. Yeah, I'm happy okay. to, I'm happy to, it's not sure. the full text amendment, it's just the part that's relevant to this. Um, sure. but, so but it's just one I page. Think, because we've been talking about but so if you have copies yeah, absolutely and, would you like me to grab them right now third i really yeah. appreciate you not speaking as long as some of our lawyers <laughs> in the room that know how to speak <laughs> at great length but just saying that's why mr nelson's not here yeah <laughs> just happy to do it so yeah i mean yeah let you, me grab them right now sure Thank no you. problem 
Audrey Novak. I'm sorry, I'm height challenged here. <laughs> um, my name is Audrey Novak. I live at 6505 Carroll Highlands Road. Um, I want to just express some of my views pertinent to what Alex just said. Um, at our open community meeting in March, Commissioner Rothstein acknowledged the magnitude of community interest surrounding the proposed project by remarking on the number of people who were in attendance. It also bears noting that there was only one party there that day that was in favor of the project, and that was Mr. Castelletti, who, by the way, is the Director of Development and Operations for the Strategic Properties LLC based in Miami, Florida. And also, he is a partner and COO of the Broadreach Rental Partners LLC based in Millersville, Maryland. Clearly not someone who has the interest of Carroll County community at his, at it, as his priority, just as um, Commissioner Kyler mentioned about his, his love of Carroll County. We all love Carroll County. Um, at that open session, Commissioner Rothstein mentioned that the clear facts are that the property is zoned commercial. That has never been a question um, about that zoning, but the fact is that the zoning is C2, which limits the commercial projects that are permitted. And examining the uh, zoning regulations, 158.158 self-storage facility, self-service storage facility, it seems that the regulations pertain to individual storage units, not a multi-unit building as proposed. Our commissioner spoke of the project being within the parameters of the zoning regulations and that the commissioners had the power to make adjustments to the law. He said that the zoning definitions were deliberate and I feel that they are vague and they need to incorporate the difference between a one-story self-service storage facility and a massive five-story 725 plus unit building that borders a quiet residential community. That disparity is what Prince George's County has defined in their newly adopted um, regulation. It is my hope that the outpouring of community support will send a message to the commissioners that there needs to be clarification as to what constitutes self-service storage facility in, in the business climate of 2023 and not 1965 when the property was zoned commercial. Our commissioner mentioned that the zoning needs to be adjusted for all of the county. Indeed, what happens in Carroll County impacts the entire county. The parameters need to be so tight that there's no need for interpretation. Once this project goes forward, there's no turning back. Um, so thank you to you and to all of the commissioners for your help and support of the citizens of Carroll County. And thank you, and I, I can tell you we're taking notes <laughs> because you it sounded like me on some of the comments I was saying. So, um, I like I like consistency. That's good. Go ahead, uh, Joe Lynch. My assistant Vanna will and Vanna White <laughs> with you. <laughs> Hello, commissioners. Yes, good morning, and thanks for doing this. Um, Commissioner Rothstein, I didn't know whether you knew or not, but there was an over-under on the first, may the fourth be with you joke, <laughs> and it was 15 <laughs> seconds, you blew it out of order. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, this is what we're here to talk about, a lot of us anyway. This big pink area here does not look like there's any kind of balance in that, Commissioner Gordon, to your point. It looks like it's way out of proportion. All these little homes here, these little dots, are where we live, and we're going to have to look at that thing if it goes to fruition. And we just have some comments about that. This is a 50 foot, 102,000 square foot, 752 unit confined self storage facility, not like the garage, just that we just spoken about. Instead of coming off Liberty Road, which the State Highway says you can no longer do, it's going to come up our little street here. You can't even, can't even hardly see it. So this means that all the traffic, that 750 units 
of storage will garner is going to come through our little street. That's trucks, any size from a semi to a rental truck that you see on the road every day. People are not going to be dropping off a deck of cards and putting it in a storage facility. They can't bring their personal car into it in most cases. It's going to be furniture. It's going to be big things that are going to be put in here. And I just think that <clears throat> when trying to zone things properly, we don't look at things like traffic that is going to be generated. No one can tell me specifically how, much, how many trucks are going to be coming down our road because there's no way to know because 752 units doesn't exist anywhere. And a, certainly a five-story building does not exist in anywhere in Cowell County that's going to do storage. So um, I'm going to make way for other people who want to comment on this, but I would just ask any change in text, uh, please do some real searching and looking and interviewing people who there are several self-storage facilities in the, on off Liberty Road, and if you talk to those people, they'll give you the facts about traffic and volumes of traffic and who uses it. We just talked to a person like that who said that every day one of their customers is a landscaper. The landscaping crew arrives in the morning, takes their tools out, goes and does their work, comes back at night. That's two trips for one facility, one unit. There's no way of telling how much traffic this thing is going to drive down our little street. Thanks for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you. And now we get to hear from Vanna. <laughs> Nancy, what? Oh, me? <laughs> thank you. And Commissioner Rothstein, we just want to thank you for holding that single issue town hall. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to go from 6.30 to 8. He stayed till after 10. So there were about 250 people there. And everybody had an opportunity to say something. So yep. we really do appreciate you listening to us. Um, many of you also know that we've done a um, petition. And we have over 2,000 signatures. We also. Um, have over 400 that the 2000 was an online petition and we kept it local uh, the in-person petition people came on Saturday to sign in person they came to the library we went door to door and that was about 400 people most of those people were um, upset about the height of the building but um, those of us who live on the street, this is our house. Mm -hmm. uh, look at all the houses all around. I mean, it's, it's a residential area. It doesn't belong there. Our main objection is the proximity to our homes. Uh, the st our street is only 20 feet wide, hardly enough for two trucks to pass each other. Um, there's no center line. The plan is to build a large construction entrance right here, and that's going to be about 25 feet from our house. Um, the building itself looks like it's going to be, the building is going to be here, and it's going to be about 50 to 75 feet from our house, it looks like, from the site plan. It's inconceivable to us that that would be allowed. Um, can you turn it over? We also did this map that shows here is the proposed site. And all the areas in green show how far away you'll be able to see this thing. Here's the reservoir. This is Baltimore County. You'll be able to see it from another county. And all the way up, 32. Um, we asked an appraiser to give us an idea of how this would affect our property values. And he didn't even think he could find an example of a project like this being so close to someone's home. Um, we talked about the Prince George's recent ordinance. And we asked that if you go that way, that you uh, consider this property being part of that. Um, it's early in the process. Um, 
they've only been as far as the technical review, which is number three. It hasn't been approved yet. No permits have been permitted or requested. Um, the Maryland law, I understand, has late vesting, which means mm -hmm. if a shovel's not in the ground, any new ordinances should apply to a proposal. Mm -hmm. So we just thank you for listening. I appreciate the homework. Ma'am, can I ask one quick favor of you, if you could? Could you okay. show that uh, other side again real quick? I just wanted to see exactly. I know I saw it. Bring it closer. Um, no, you're fine where you are. Okay. I just wanted to see where your house was in reference again. Okay. If you could just point that out. Um, this is the site, mm -hmm. and this is our. You're right there. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that. Okay. This is um, a future planned roadway that goes mm -hmm. right through our property, but there's a bit. Linda has told us there's a good chance that won't happen. Okay. So we're no. We're not so yeah. concerned about that. Understood. I appreciate that. Thank you. And a year ago, I went door knocking on their house, right? Yeah. Okay. Sarah Penn. <coughs> Oh, sure. I can show my house. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah Penn. I have Vanna, too. Aren't I lucky? <laughs> so this is my house, um, 6504 Panorama. My whole, the whole back of my house is windows. It's beautiful. I've got those big Palladian doors and the big arched windows and skylights. Uh, and then I'll look at a storage unit maybe one day. Uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to about talk about a change in text. So um, I'm Sarah Penn. Uh, the defi definition of residential by Oxford is designed for people to live in private residential and nursing homes, a little weird, but um, occupied by private houses, quieter traffic in residential areas. Webster's defines it as a building used as a home, definition of a home, the place where one lives permanently, especially as a member of a family or household. Um, and then the opposite of that, what is the meaning of an industrial zone? Um, a little hard to find a definition. This is from Lev Capital, it's a finance firm. Industrial zoning refers to land that permits the manufacturing of industrial products, factories, power plants. Um, it also includes spaces that create, store, or distribute products. That's what a storage unit is, right? It, it stores things. Uh, we have been told time and time again, because there are 30 other units within a 10-mile radius of this, of this place, um, that most people are using these big multi-level storage units to store stuff for their businesses. Um, so. Uh, Mr. Commissioner uh, Rothstein, you said that you're looking for relevant, safe, and secure education uh, for Carroll County, and I'm not quite sure how this type of facility in a residential area does any of that um, for us. I think that these massive storage facilities absolutely belong in industrial areas. Um, and I will again reference our Freedom Act. Uh, the government will not attempt to fundamentally transform communities against the will of existing homeowners and residents. Recognizing that freedom, freedom is a suburban rural area, government will respect the character of communities in its neighborhoods. Um, I don't see how a giant multi-purpose building in a residential area does anything to align with the Freedom Act. So I think that these buildings, and I think that you will find that most of the community will support something like this in an industrial area that's not just r literally wreaking havoc on, on, our, on our little neighborhood uh, that was built 50 my house was built 58 years ago so thank you when you said freedom act you mean freedom plan freedom, freedom community com com i'm so sorry freedom community comprehensive plan yes okay yep okay next is alicia drink I was practicing the whole time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a lot of letters. You ignore them out. She's my next door neighbor. Actually, I'll I'll be really short. Um, I think most people before me have said it better. Um, I do want to thank the commissioners for even um, taking this on. I really didn't think that you would. You have surprised me in the best way possible. Um, and I thought it was a little bit of lip service when you said that you love Carroll County, but I can see that. Um, that is true, that you are really thinking about how this would impact um, the communities here. Um, and I would also kind of like to tie it into the things um, that have come before um, and sort of maybe we need redefinitions 
a lot of our, our laws and codes have been written decades ago when a storage facility was just a single story thing. But that's not the only, I'm sure, example of a, a, a definition like that, um, where it was understood to mean one thing at a certain time and it is no longer understood in that same way. Um, and so I would encourage um, once this gets started um, to maybe take that into other areas of the code and make sure that it does um, all fit well with our county. I did move here. I'm from a rural, rural area in the Midwest. Um, and so I moved here because it reminded me of home and that is what I loved about it. And I hope that it stays that way. Thank you. Thank you. I believe our last speaker is Thomas McNeil. Uh, good morning, uh, Tom McNeil. I live at 6515 Carroll Highlands Road, maybe five houses <laughs> down and on, on that little tiny street as it's been described. I, I uh, wanted to voice my uh, support and concern. Uh, I've driven around Baltimore and looked at some of these uh, um, five-story storage buildings and they are monstrosities. And uh, it, and I can't say anything more than it's already been said, except thank you for consideration. Yes, sir. Thank you. Roberta, anyone else? That was it. Chris, is there anyone else on the line? No, sir. Okay. Um, let, let me uh, let me take the um, uh, the beginning of this one. Because um, I feel like it's a follow-on from the community uh, meeting we had a couple months ago, and um, you know, for, first off, I, I want to applaud my colleague uh, Commissioner Garin because you reached out to me a couple weeks ago about this and highlighted the Prince George's County uh, recent ordinance, which I was unaware of. Um, so that you know was a pretty good catalyst to keep this thing going and make decisions I don't like to sit on the sidelines and wait till you know the cows come home and then make a decision I mean this is something active and I appreciate the comment about late vesting and the homework done um, so putting it on our agenda today I felt was very important and I appreciate again the uh, the input from those here and also the continuing input that I know I get and I would expect my colleagues also uh, receive. Consistency, just like the last uh, action, is really important to me uh, for the entirety of Carroll County. Uh, for those that have quoted me from that uh, one town hall, you got it right. Um, and I, I appreciate that. You know, um, I try to be as straightforward as I can. Um, as I shared in the town hall, uh, when it did come to safety and security, um, I did ask our sheriff uh, at a previous town hall about safety and security. And he shared with me that in his history of 30 plus years, he has never gone to a um, storage facility for a, uh, an activity regarding safety and security. Um, it was also brought up about eminent domain. Um, there is no discussion on eminent domain down in Eldersburg uh, or the southern part of the county. Um, so some things I just want to clear up real quick. Um, <clears throat> I found it interesting about the zoning discussion and I took that back and I spoke to Linda and Chris and Roberta and Tim and I said, okay, how does the 64 zoning compare to the Freedom Plan? Because the Freedom Plan, there's some very subjective words in the Freedom Plan, you know, to uh, um, kind of blend into a community and that kind of stuff. And, and the first day I took this role, I held up the Freedom Plan. I said, I didn't write this, but I inherited it. It's mine, you know, and I embrace it. There may be some problems with it, and we'll work through it, but it's something we need to embrace. 
And so I said, how can I compare the zoning with this very large facility that does not conform to the Freedom Plan? It, I mean, there, it conflicts with the Freedom Plan. Zoning takes precedence if things move along, but with the late vesting and the shovel not in the ground, how far are they really along if they've only gone through the TRC and there's still issues and to date I do not believe they've come back in any reply from the TRC so I do feel we have um, an opportunity here uh, the Prince George's County um, ordinance does also talk about grandfathering projects that are already in place or projects that are uh, kind of in development um, but again if I look at that compared to the term late vesting you know there's a there's a disparity there there's there's space there um, I take it from Prince George's County if the, if projects are kind of working themselves through they probably already have permits and they probably already have shovels in the ground and that's a different topic this we're not even close to uh, so we do have an opportunity um, <clears throat> when I was asked um, at that community event or town hall whatever we want to call it you know would I want it in my you know space in my backyard I said well I live in a community where I have residential on both sides of me actually all around me so it couldn't be that didn't satisfy a lot of folks and then they said well what if you didn't I said okay if I didn't I'd be sitting right there with you and that's what I said um, and I mean I that's the truth uh, because I wouldn't want a large facility in my backyard or front yard there's um there's a lot of challenges to this that cannot be fixed the pro the property right now is on a hill so 50 feet off a hill is 60 plus feet off the road you know or you know it's it's very very large um, not having the access to State Highway 26 um, makes it very challenging um, and encroaches on the surrounding property um, the uh, It, it, to me it has nothing to do with how many storage facilities are there in Carroll County or in Eldridge, but I mean that's a business decision that a businessman or woman is going to make on whether they want another car wash nail salon or storage facility that's that's their decisions it's commercial property it's private property and they should be allowed to make that that decision um, within the parameters of what's zoned and that's really what c this comes down to um, You know, uh, when I went door knocking and we did, we talked, um, I didn't know about this activity that was happening. I said, but I'm definitely going to look into it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't care for it. Um, I did talk to the developer about doing a subterranean floor, you know, to make it only four feet or four floors. Um, and they said they would look at that uh, I haven't gotten anything back from them anyway uh, or since um, um, but I do take the community's comments when uh, and, and I'll shut up in a second when um, Piney Run was discussed about dredging and the dam you know development uh, well the dam had to be done because of the situation dam but the dredging boy did that come to, to play remember Chris and uh, Linda I mean we got thousand plus two thousand comments within 24 hours and the community matters and they didn't want the Piney Run to be dredged because it would take two to three years to fill naturally and the beauty of Piney Run they felt outweighed um, Piney Run as a water source um, and they're educated and uh, you know we ensured that the community is educated on what's going on um, so the community matters um, in their comments the uh, oh yeah the, the, the last point is 
just like disabled property with Marysville 2. We can't fix Marysville 2 Road. So we looked at the, the zoning and what could be actually put in that big property and lessen the density because of the traffic that could go on to Marysville 2. It's the same thing with this. If we're not allowed to do anything on State Highway 26 on Liberty Road and things have to go into these side roads, there's that concern that there's only so much space and we're really limited um, on that space. It, with that said, we gotta be careful what we ask for because we limit the, uh, um, the structure or, or uh, what could go there. It could have a whole lot more traffic, you know? If it's a Taco Bell or a nail salon or a car wash or something else that's allowed, you know? Not saying any of those are even being thought of, but you just, we never know. Um, so I, I think we can safely get this back to um, the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, you know, for their review um, and take, it's really sad to say, take a lesson from Prince George's County, but <laughs> uh, it does hurt to say that. <laughs> but, um, and, and put something in place in a, uh, like Commissioner Guerin said, we're not shy to look at text amendments and moratoriums and when necessary, we gotta do things what's right. So, okay, that's my opening and closing salvo, I hope. Um, any yeah, any yes. comments? Yeah, I, um, well, A, yes, I do love Carroll County. Um, I do not have the same affinity for Prince George's County. I <laughs> don't wanna copy anything they do. Um, but, we're looking at the wrong topic. Um, I always struggle when you want to do a rule because of one thing and you end up regretting it a few years later. Is a mini storage the only building that could be on this property at that's 50 foot high? We allow 50 foot high as our C, as part of the C2, so any building could be 50 exactly. feet high. So uh, I, I just, I don't think hardly anybody that's objecting to this really cares that it's, that it's a mini storage. Mini storage is a passive use. I've used them. Trust me, I didn't. I took my car there, um, and most people did. Um, it's a pretty passive use, and, and, and I, I think one, the one thing Commissioner Rothstein said, watch what you wish for. I think I'd love to hear everybody opposed to this say, if one of the other how many things can go in this commercial right. dozens and dozens and dozens of things that are allowed in here um, you're not going to object to it because it's not a, a mini storage uh, I, I just don't think mini storage is the issue I think um, we've got a re residential unit um, around a commercial zone property and that's what people are objecting to. And I understand mm -hmm. that. Um, I, I moved into town of Manchester in the 70s. Across the street was a bar and two doors down the street was a bar. As other people moved in, they objected to the bar. And I'm like, when you bought your house, wasn't there a bar there? <laughs> you know, did somebody put it up last week? Now, I have a whole different feeling on the solar thing because most of those people bought their houses before the rules got changed this isn't the case and and i'm not i'm not saying um there should or shouldn't be a mini storage there but watch what you wish for because uh, there's a lot of other uses that are going to have way more traffic and i dealt briefly with the mini storage in Anne Arundel um, because it was heated et cetera, et cetera. and my concern more than traffic was that most of the time I'd go there to get something or put something there was nobody in there I was by myself and I worried more about safety mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. as the sheriff said isn't a problem so I understand that everybody how everybody feels passionate about this but I think what you're objecting to is the zoning of the property. And so I don't know that that can or can't change or be looked at. 
So yeah. like the height, the bulk requirements right now is 50 feet. So what if it was like 30 feet that butts up against residential? So you know, so it's so not- So if it were a 50 foot office building, they'd be happier. No, no, no it's- I it, wouldn't that, think that's so. That's what, that's what my it point could is. be, correct? Because where you're going is the bulk, mm -hmm. the height is What not, I'm saying, yeah. uh, there could be an office building put there that is 50 foot high. Is that less objectionable? No. No. Exactly. Right. So it has nothing to do with that. It's a mini That's storage. That's correct. It has and, to do and with the, the office building would have right. 20 times the traffic. Yep. And and I I don't completely understand. Yeah. The state has has absolutely said this property can't access. Correct. Not not that they have to do too much construction. They can't access. Right. And and that makes it. But again, um, like I say, there's a lot of other uses on on commercial. Watch what you wish for. Yeah. Yep. And and again, I'm fine with us looking, you know, yeah. it's just like I said mm -hmm. the last time, more power look at it. I would be opposed to a moratorium or I mean, I just feel like if if it's been zoned that this building could go there since the 60s, um nobody should be real shocked. And you're shaking your head, but it's been zoned that this building could go there since the 60s, it correct? Has not. It would be in our So the So going back to where you, yeah it wasn't necessarily the storage facility but it's the bulk requirement it's the height and the so, bulk and so and maybe I, going back to planning and zoning it could be like hey look at 30 feet of commercial zoned area next to resident or something like that but yeah, okay um, and, and the town of Hampstead has buildings taller than this to, to say there aren't buildings as tall and they're right. on a residential street but but that doesn't make it right or wrong, but do we really want to blacklist any building over at 50 foot from the entire county from commercial zoning? No. I, no. I wouldn't think so. I don't. So to me, this is a baby step and I don't care if we vote to take it or we don't right. take it, right. but I think yeah. um, a year from now, there's gonna be people in here saying, well, I can't believe it's gonna be 10 times the traffic of a mini storage and uh and and it will be mm -hmm. i think watch what you wish for commissioner no, I, you want to no i just you know i think i think commissioner carla does bring up a, an interesting point um mm -hmm. that i don't think we're making the planning and zoning's job commission's job any easier but if if we do are able to focus on block requirements because i do believe that's what the heart of the matter is like right. commissioner rossi mentioned block requirements for people who don't know that's the dimensions bottom line that's bulk requirements but you know looking at the fact that if it's you know surrounded on three or more sides by residential and there's a specific distance that um, maybe even more particular height requirements or bulk requirements uh, pertain to that and uh, and it's other cases where it's c1 c2 c3 sure yeah i mean that's what we have where i live and we all live in areas where there's three or four story buildings for commercial and that makes a lot of sense so the, uh, you know, what's interesting about this particular case is, so people, so if people aren't aware, uh, commissioner of government government's kind of interesting because the commissioner actually has legislative and executive authority, and it's unique in that respect. So the fact that we're looking at this right now, I think is exactly the kind of thing we should be doing. I'm appreciative of my colleagues that unanimously agreed, yeah, let's put this on the agenda. And I have to thank the staff, uh, Chris and Linda, for getting ahead of this. Uh, we had a quick meeting yesterday. As you well know, we can't all attend the same meetings. That's not allowed. So when we do one-off meetings, that's just the way it is uh, to not violate the Open Meetings Act. Is that correct, sir? So yeah, you've reminded of, of that. Uh, you reminded us of, uh, of that a few times. But um, the point being, I never saw a lawyer tongue-tied. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but the, my my point being, uh, th this is exactly the kind of thing we should be doing. I appreciate the heads, uh, the the pre-work that's already been done on this. The bulk requirements issue seems to be the one we should be focusing on. And Commissioner Kyler brings up an interesting one as well that we may have to look at some other provisions. In particular uh, you know I I hope this helps the situation in Carroll Highlands uh, I, I another impetus for doing so was to get ahead of of the next Carroll Highlands which let's face it it's probably out there someplace and in, and who knows in those situations the people that live in that area maybe it's a more urbanized area and then people won't have any objection to it at all 
but uh, I think this entire episode is a testament to the, you know, the county and the county residents speaking out, letting their voices be heard, and us as county commissioners exercising those legislative executive authorities that we, that we have, to, and we should use them to make this county better, address concerns by citizens. That's what it's really all about. So uh, I know we've got some other comments to make, but I'm certainly uh, have complete approval of this motion. And again, appreciate the work the staff's done ahead of this uh, because they have spent a considerable amount of time on this issue before we even sat down today. So, and thank you for uh, Ms. Wyndham for putting some of that stuff together. More comments? Sure. Did you want to go first, Commissioner? Go ahead. So um, I, I will do my best to be brief. Uh, yeah, I certainly agree with a lot of what's been said so far, and I support referring this to the, the Planning Commission. Um, so, so for me, um, and I didn't really, I guess, explain this clearly enough in, in, the, last, uh, in the last thing that we talked about with uh, uh, restaurants, but for me it's all about a, kind of a balance again. You know, we'd all talked about things being a balance, and then for me going back to the issue with the solar development in agriculturally zoned land, it's a question of fittingness. You know, so for me, looking at the issue that we just went through with the, the restaurants, something like a winery with their, uh, uh, that is located uh, with a vineyard that is producing locally sourced ingredient pizzas is a lot more fitting than a 50-foot tall storage facility surrounded by residential houses um, or residential area. And I, I um, completely agree that I think we should also be looking at those bulk requirements, at the, the, the size, the dimensions, and the distance between the, any kind of facility that goes there and the, the residential as well. And I think also to the point that, that yes, there were areas that were zoned decades in the past. In this case, I think we're 60 plus years in the past. And I think as Commissioner Guerin had mentioned and Commissioner Rawlstein had also alluded to, that it's important that we re-examine these things because you know, the nature of, of, of you know, the nature of times change. And if we want to continue to preserve the best of who we are and what we are, we have to be flexible and adaptive to, to certain changes. Uh, and in some cases, that, that doesn't mean you know, saying, okay, well, let's you know, allow 100-foot buildings. Maybe in a situation like this, we look at rezoning the property itself to prevent something like this at all from going there. Um, and, and I'm certainly, you know, like with the, uh, the last thing that we talked about with the restaurants, I'm certainly open to seeing different options. Um, but, but again, you know, the idea that, that you would have a 50-foot-plus tall storage facility with the hill in addition to increasing that height, uh, you know, in the middle of a bunch of homes, you know, there's not a fittingness that, that goes there. And then when we talk about trying to preserve agriculture or the rural aspects of our county or the, the residential, you know, the suburban aspects of our county as well, um, you know, I'm totally in agreement with what's been said that this should go to planning and zoning and that we should be looking at these different aspects of it. So, and then thank you both of you for your work too. I know that since we've We've uh, taken office. We've gone through quite a number of, of zoning uh, 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 issues and, and mm -hmm. raised issues with zoning, and I appreciate both of you and your willingness and your patience with us in doing that. You know, because it, as everybody up here will, will tell anybody in the audience, you know, at the end of the day, we uh, you know, we cannot do our jobs effectively if we don't have input from citizens. We might not always agree. We might not always come down on the same side. Uh, but at least hearing issues that are raised by m citizens, by members of our community, helps us to do our jobs more effectively and, and to better serve them in turn. Again, we, at the end of the day, we may disagree with certain citizens over certain things, but as you guys know and as you've done, you take those concerns into account and in what you present to us and how we try to work through things. Um, and I said this at my, uh, at, when I spoke at my uh, business breakfast on uh, Monday. I am so genuinely honored to be serving with these four gentlemen. I mean, they, they really do take constituent concerns seriously. They really do take public input seriously. And the same goes for you guys, too, you know, whether you're a county attorney or whether you're handling planning and zoning or whether you're the county administrator. I know there are people all over this uh, building really do take constituent input seriously. And uh, the last thing I'll say, I promise, this is the last thing I'll say, and I, again, I brought this up Monday when I was being asked some questions about zoning. Um, you know, when I was running for a commissioner, no, solar wasn't even a, a question. You know, nobody, nobody was talking about solar uh, in, or developments uh, when I was running. But over the course of the first, you know, several weeks in office, it became an issue, and residents started coming to us in, in, in by the dozens saying, we've got concerns about this. And, and, you know, we are, you know, we're doing our best to be as receptive as possible to the residents. And, and again, 
if there is a concern or an issue, do not ever hesitate to be in touch with us. You know, I mean, I, Commissioner uh, Rossi, and again, you know, going from that, that town hall that was supposed to go from 6.30 to 8 and being there until after 10, you know, speaks volumes about your willingness to hear citizens out. It and wouldn't to, let me out. <laughs> <laughs> and to both you and to Commissioner Guerin for, for bringing this up today, I think is also a, a benefit and it is also a testament to your receptiveness. So, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to support this today. Can you talk about the pirate? No, I'm kidding. I can bring the pirates up again. <laughs> can we tie that in somehow to bulk requirements? I don't know. Um, bulk pirates. Bulk pirates, okay. Um, but no, just kind of reiterating a couple points by my colleagues. I, I appreciate both uh, Commissioner Rothstein and Commissioner Guerin, one, finding the uh, ability to kind of dig deeper into this, and obviously uh, uh, Commissioner Guerin into looking into some zoning in some other areas. I find that uh, quite intriguing for a variety of reasons. and. Uh, you know, to Commissioner Kyler's point, you know, if we do start looking at things in, in a one-size-fits-all, I think that does put us in an exceptionally challenging situation just because it works one place doesn't mean it works somewhere else effectively. Um, personally, I would like to see us within this discussion, to Commissioner Guerin's point, maybe look at this with the bulk uh, requirements in. If we are looking with three sides being residential, you know, let's let's consider that versus, say, if there's going to be a, a high, you know, high-rise uh, office space someplace else a little bit different you know surrounding and contiguous properties um, but I, I do support this so I'll leave it with that because I think everybody else has covered it well and well I got another question <laughs> one more I, I won't promise oh, this will be the good. last um, something that that we forget about and and I know I've been involved in some things similar to this and you get upset because it's allowed by zoning and maybe even that's appealed and it passes because it's allowed by zoning we also have plan approval and and we forget about that in the process if the state highway let them access route 26 we can't control a traffic study the state does but with them accessing the side streets we can control that and so there'd have to be a traffic study and I don't know if physically they can modify those streets enough to allow for what the traffic study says and then there's also stormwater management there's also when you're on a limited size site with a big building mm -hmm. there's a lot of other parameters and and I'm not saying you guys should hold off for this but it you know I think we need to look too if there's something doing the plan process um, you know um, and access is one of the things that zoning doesn't care about but the plan submittal process carries very cares very much about it and and I don't want to see us make zoning rules that are already covered with our planning process you know you know what I'm saying does that make sense very much so. and and uh, the traffic study on this by not being on the Keep shaking your head all you want. Um, I've done traffic studies. How many have you done? They already, uh, they already changed their requirements. They don't, they're required to do a traffic study for this. For this so reason. you guys wouldn't do a traffic study? So, um, yeah, I'll clarify traffic studies. So um, a, um, the county requirements for a traffic study are outlined in the Department of Public Works manual, right? And the, the general requirements are that if a proposed use is going to generate less than 25 peak hour trips, a traffic study is not required. If it's going to generate between 25 and 50, then it's optional for the county to determine over 50, it's absolutely required. Now that being said, the um, Planning Commission has the authority to require a traffic study regardless of those requirements. So if when this goes to the Planning Commission, if it is felt that a traffic impact study should be done and they agree, they can require one to, to occur. And, and, and if, a, if a many storage has any kind of the traffic that people are describing, it would be required, but I don't think it does. But, right. but the Planning Commission could require it. Yes. They could right. look at the streets and say, Yes, there's residential houses mm -hmm. right here. We need to do a traffic study. Yes, and they, they, they absolutely it, could. Right. And to, um, to touch on, it's been mentioned a couple times, the access onto 26. So uh, I think as everybody's familiar, this plan was submitted. It went to TRC, and all of the review agencies that are required to look at it have looked at it and have provided comments. We have not received a, res a submittal back yet addressing those comments. Right. 
one of the agencies that reviewed this was State Highway, and State Highway's comment was, because there is access onto a county roadway, they were not going to allow access onto 26. One of our, en uh, uh, our engineering review comments was that sight distance of where the proposed entrance onto Carroll Highlands does not meet sight distance, so a variance request would be needed. So it's arguable that there is not an, a suitable entrance onto a Carroll County Road. So then we need to go back. The developer has received these comments. The developer needs to come up with a solution, either going back to State Highway and saying, no, there's not access onto Carroll County Roads, so we need to have access onto 26. Or they need to come back to DPW, the Carroll County DPW, and say, we need to have a variance request. So, or variance approved. So that's still very much up in the air. We have not yet had a submittal to come back to us to figure out which direction the developer is going to go and how that issue will get resolved. And, and I do know State State Highway MDOT's very quick to deny access, mm -hmm. but then right, there's absolutely. very often times I'm processing one right now where they say, well, you were right, we have to give mm -hmm. you access. Mm -hmm. But they can make you do a lot of things, yes. turn lanes and such, but mm -hmm it's hard for them to deny access so. that is correct this is um very valuable discussion i appreciate taking the time on this um you know consistency as shared before conformity you know with the freedom plan with the zoning putting it all together because people look at well this doesn't conform or you know work with the freedom plan but this is works with the zoning we've we've had those conversations um you know that's why we also have a team looking at you know helping us with the master plan right and uh, countywide um, and your you know the roadshow of folks going out saying what else do we want this county to look like you know um, is important mm -hmm. and it's not us on the dais or you at the table they're going to come up with all the answers it doesn't work that way and uh, no matter what other people may think um, it's it's the community. So, you know, there's problems out there. We know what they are. Uh, and those that we don't, let's identify them. But if we know what they are, let's come up with solutions countywide. And this, you know, is a good example of that. Um, so, okay, are there any other comments? With, I'd like to- With the motion as written, yeah. does that still allow you guys to look at some of the other things we've discussed or would you rather us make the motion more specific or you're fine the with motion's it? motion's pretty general. It's up to you. To, uh, honestly, I mean, I think we know the direction that you want to go in, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. But if you want to make a more restrictive or more concise motion, that's fine. It's I mean, to, to me, the, the, um, the activity here is looking at really bulk requirements mm -hmm. of uh, commercial and industrial properties uh, specifically next to um, residential. I mean, that's the, that's really what we're, that's the we're issue, focused yeah, on. The two big ones, but so, to, to your point earlier, I, I think we probably don't want to make it too right. specific exactly. as well. Exactly, yeah. That was my as question. As long as they've that. got the latitude mm -hmm. they yeah. need, I'm, yes. I'm happy. But, but I mean, that's, I that, that's know. the focus. <laughs> you know we want to take this so yes. but if we leave it open i'll just make the motion board of county commissioners forward to proposed zoning text amendments to the planning and zoning commission for their review and recommendations second, second. i got a motion in a couple of seconds and further discussion great discussion we had all in favor aye, aye. aye. okay thank you thank you, thank you very much to a thank parking you. study thank you everybody thank you yes for the current and future planned Carroll County complex. And we can give it a minute if people want to. Uh, Thank you leave. all. Wait. Feel free. We'll just give it a minute. Of course I've got your back. Okay, Nancy, no more crank calls, okay? Okay, just saying. <clears throat>
There's a purse under there, too. I don't know if that's some. Yes, sir. Have a good day. And Alex, a lawyer with few words. I like that. <laughs> Take care. Okay. As shared, parking study for the current and future plan, Carroll County Government Complex. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Building Construction, requests your approval to award an increase to the current contract to Mann's Woodward Studios in the amount of $40,000 to perform a parking study for the current and future plan Carroll County Government Complex. Mans Woodward Studios currently holds the design contract for the future construction of the Carroll County Sheriff's Office building located in the plan complex and will incorporate the proposed study into the contract for future use in design. This amount is not included in the FY23 budget. However, a year end adjustment will be performed by budget for this amount. And I'll now turn it over to Eric. Good morning, Commissioners. As morning. Maureen stated, we're here this morning to request your approval to award a contract to Mans Woodward uh, to uh, make the change to the contract for Mans Woodward Studio in the amount of 40000 to perform a parking study for the current and future planned Carroll County Government Complex. Uh, this study will help the Bureau of Building Construction better understand the needs of the current and potential future parking around the complex. The scope of work that is included in this uh, proposal was is uh, quantifying existing spaces and current and projected building occupancies and determining what, if any, additional parking may be required to meet the City of Westminster's parking regulations. Uh, a short-term parking plan to address parking during construction of the Office of the State's Attorney and Carroll County Sheriff's Office Law Enforcement Building. Uh, it will also demonstrate the need or lack thereof for a parking garage and perform a life cycle analysis of surface parking versus a parking garage. And I'm happy to, to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions or public comment on this one? Sounds great. See any? Okay. Motion to award a contract to Mans Woodward Studios to perform a parking study for the current and future planned Carroll County Government Complex in the amount of forty thousand dollars. Second. A motion got second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Let's talk about Shock Creek Linings. Across the county. Mm. Good morning. Morning. Ugh. Morning. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Roads Operation, requests your approval to use pot pro shot concrete incorporated to pneumatically apply shot creek to pipe inverts under county roads at a cost of three hundred and thirty thousand nine hundred and eighty six dollars. This cost includes mobilization stream diversion, debris removal, traffic control, and invert paving. This service is being purchased via a contract with Harford County that was competitively bid. This amount is within the approved budget and no additional funds should be necessary. And I'll turn it over to Kathy and Jim. Good morning. As you can see, um, this amount of money consists, uh, includes eight separate pipes that are located throughout the county. We have some down on Patton Drive in the lower portion of the county, clean up to Kreidler Schoolhouse and Harvey Yingling. The faulty pipes have caused um, drainage issues. It has also caused mm -hmm. part of the roads to collapse, and, and they're just failures. So we want to contract this out to ProShot. They've done work with us in the past for many, many years to get these road pipes repaired so we can get the roads sturdy and, and in good shape again. Any questions? I just have a question of, uh, I think liability is not the right word. And I, I only ask this because I actually grew up in one of these neighborhoods, so I know it's county roads. Correct. But there's not an HOA because the developer still owns lots in the HOA. So isn't there, isn't there any liability for who put these in that they need to be fixed? You, I, I know the question probably makes sense, but right. it might not be completely accurate in how I'm asking it. Once the developers turn the roads over to the county and we take full responsibility after the developments are finished, all stormwater systems are ours. Even what's under it. Even yeah. what's under it. 
even what <clears throat> runs through the lots, unfortunately. Okay. Under the uh, uh, public works agreements is the uh, official term for them. So as we do a development, uh, the public works agreements that are agreed to prior to development starting, uh, once all that development has been completed and accepted on final inspection, then it is the county's responsibility to maintain those in perpetuity beyond that uh, to what we use primarily as about 50 foot beyond the outfalls then on any private property. Once it's into that, it's the private property under as far as drainage. Thank you, sir. Is anybody able to uh, tell me, I guess, what the closest municipality or town or even what district any of these are in? Yeah. Yes. Patton Drive is down off of Woodbine Road. So I, I get confused with everybody's district. Mm -hmm. Sherritt Roads are up in the Tawny Town area. Um, outside of Tawny Town, Gillis Falls is down on the lower lower end of the county. Bethel Road is down off of Gillis Road as well, down in. Most of it's them. our area yeah. four, but it would be yeah. you know the the it's different also district. Four. <laughs> that yeah. also um, Base Wars Mill, Tawny Town area as well. Uh, Kryler Schoolhouse is out towards the Manchester area, and Kryler Schoolhouse Road and Harvey Yingling are out towards Manchester Pennsylvania line. Thank you very much. I mean, it's always interesting because I, um, it's you, you see the the road and certain roads go pretty far, and so I'm always interested to to know where exactly they fall, because um, you know, like if you just say like oh Patton Drive, but you, you're not familiar with it, it's just interesting to know where they are. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. And they changed our maps just to confuse everybody. I know, and I don't <laughs> have it. I don't have it down yet. Neither do we. Me, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there a motion out there? <clears throat> motion to approve the shotcrete lining to Pro Shot Concrete Incorporated in the amount of three hundred thirty-three thousand nine hundred eighty-six dollars. Second. A motion, to second. Any discussion? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Let's Thank talk you. about. Thank you. Twenty twenty-three yeah. gravel road chip seal project. On April twentieth of this year, you, the board, heard the protest hearing brought by Russell Standard concerning. The notice of intent to award the 2023 gravel road trip seal chip seal project to American Paving Fabrics Incorporated. The board upheld, <coughs> excuse me, the board upheld by a vote of three to two to affirm the decision of the Office of Procurement to move forward with the award to American Paving Fabrics. The Office of Procurement, along with the Bureau of Roads Operations, are here today to officially request your approval to award the 2023 gravel road chip seal project contract to American Paving Fabrics in the amount of $776,325 to double chip seal 11.15 miles of existing county gravel roadways. Um, this amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds should be needed. I got problem with this. I had problem with this during the protest um, I have problem with this now. It's three hundred thousand more than um, another company that can do the work. Um, they may have done some negative work, but was it was there enough quality control put in place for them to have fixed some of the problems that they had? Um, I, I felt that the protest, you know, discussion itself uh, was not you know, um, well represented by those that participated uh, from both companies. Uh, American Paving didn't even come in to have the conversation and Russell Standard, I felt, um, could have been a bit more prepared in under, you know, getting a decision out of us in a different way. I, um, I mean, if we're going to be fiscally conservative in what we do and we know that these companies can do the work then I'm not sure why I want to spend 300,000 more on a company well, so and, that, and that's well I have a question about that I agree with uh, everything but the dollars America uh, Russell Standard was only four or five percent low on the unit price the biggest difference in the total bid was their estimated quantities. Will they be paid based on their estimated quantities or will they be paid on measurements and actually what they do? 
because that'll make the, a big difference in that extra money. But I, and and all I saw was the bid pages. I didn't see you know the method of payment and all that. Correct. They will be paid on the actual square yardage that they they lay on the roads. And I understand where what you mean by the, the cost difference. And I wasn't here. I was in a in a um, conference in Nebraska for the for the hearing. If you go back to look at 2020, 2021, the bid amounts were once again about this amount difference, and it was given to Russell Standard. But the quantities were also thirty thousand square yards shy of what American Paving had bid. So in 22, the numbers were a little bit closer, and American Paving actually, you know, won the bid. This year, the quantities again are 30,000 square yards lower. So I think once Russell Standard would come and do the work, I think they would come back for a change order because of being so low. And I think that once that 30,000 square yard change order was put in there, you're talking four or $5,000 difference. If they truly bill what the roads are American paving comes out they measure all the roads prior to bidding Russell standard to my knowledge does not and I think that's where the variance in the quantities come because American does the due, di due diligence whereas Russell standard doesn't come out and run these roads every yeah. you know and, and every, I don't know whose quantities quote. are correct but I, I think it would have only been a four or five percent difference if I they mean, both had the same. American quantity. paving is equal to my quantities. I go out and I measure these roads, and their quantities are the same as mine, within about four or five thousand square yards. Because we didn't hear this the other week. Right. I, w I wasn't here. <laughs> I was in, in Nebraska at a conference. How was your conference? It was good. It was good. It was very mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Um, so I understand what you're saying. No, so maybe, maybe so in that case, maybe we're just lucky not to have accepted the. Uh, well, I, I think the money would have been within five percent uh, when what they actually and, and I, paid I at the end, no matter who that. was right or wrong. Yeah. It, it's not the difference it looks like. Right. Because if of the how quantities were apples to apples versus apples to oranges, yeah. it would have been very very minimal. And this isn't okay. the right time, okay. but wouldn't it be? A, a clearer bid result if you did estimated quantities for this work in the bid or you don't feel like you want to take that risk <laughs> it's a toughie it Good is question. a toughie like i said i measure all of these roads they have a list of all the roads they have the list of the mileages it, it, it's it's math it's basic oh, math. I know. so they have the 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 widths of every road and you know and there's so many narrow spots and wider spots you can't be a hundred percent accurate on the entire road so you might have 14 feet but you might go to 22 feet where there's a pull off so they have the length and they have the average width so they just have to do the math yes so i either they didn't acknowledge my lengths and widths, or they tried to do their own, or they just tried to. Or they skipped the road. I mean, well, you know, it's, it's something it's right. Yeah, but for it's the for thirty thousand square yards, that's substantial. That's a lot. That is a lot. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I get it. Um, I appreciate that information. That, but that to me is new information, which yes. adds up to you know the um, protest not being accepted right but I feel like the protest wasn't accepted not based on that so that's why I brought this up which so. wouldn't change my vote yeah but on that but right it, it will today yeah okay are there any any questions on this and I appreciate that is there a motion Motion to award the contract to American Paving Fabrics Incorporated to complete the double chip seal of county gravel roadways in the amounts of $776,325. Second. I got a motion, I got a second, a discussion. Seen here, none all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Let's talk about structure, condition, inspection, evaluation, reporting of Carroll County's minor bridges.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think it is. <coughs> the office of barely. The barely. <laughs> <laughs> the office of procurement. Not the good part. Barely afternoon. <laughs> you will not be interrupted again. Go ahead. <laughs> The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Engineering, requests your approval to award a contract to Wallace Montgomery and Associates for the structure, condition, inspection, evaluation, and reporting of the counties of Carroll County's minor bridges in the amount of forty-three thousand five hundred twenty-three dollars and thirty-three cents. This award will be made through a term contract, and the amount is within the adopted budget. And I'll turn it over to Chris and Doug. Thank you. As part of our bridge program, we must complete inspections of our minor structures, which are classified to be minor structures by the Fi Federal Highway Administration when they're less than 20 feet in length. These inspections are in in completed by trained inspectors in accordance with the National Bridge Inspection Standards Program, with a final inspection report being signed and sealed by a professional engineer. This round of inspections will start in July of 2023 and finish up in July of 2025 and inspect seven of our minor structures. Four of these structures conditions require us to perform annual inspections of these structures. These inspections uh, of the structure, structures ensure that they remain in safe operating condition and any areas of concern are noted so we can make the necessary repairs or revise the structure postings. Uh, as was mentioned, this work will be performed by our contractor, Wallace Montgomery and Associates, and they've performed this work for us in the past. How many minor bridges do we have in the county? We have 20. And what about the ones that are on the county lines uh, between? <laughs> we alternate. We alternate. We have okay. a long, long standing agreement, and it goes back for many, many years. We built one, it, Frederick County owns it. We and. Yeah, we alternate. We all know who owns which structure. Okay, thanks. So we don't stop halfway. No, <laughs> no, we own everything lock, stock, and barrel. So, but it's different <coughs> with our with Howard County, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Yeah. So Frederick County, it's every other one, right? And with Howard County, I think we own them all. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Really? Mm. Congratulations. Well, but like we Woodbine. The, it's right. below the county lines on right. the other side of the structure, so the water isn't yeah. the county line. So, hmm. interesting. Okay, we'll move the board and commissioners approve using term contract with Wallace Montgomery and Associates LLP for the structure condition inspection, evaluation, and reporting of Carroll County's minor bridge structures in the amount of $43,523.33. Second, I have a motion, I have a second. Any discussion? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's talk about Bandy Avenue traffic calming device installation. Chris, is there anyone on the line? No, sir. Okay. Do we have comments? Are those folks waiting to. No. Nope. Are they waiting okay. to speak? No. Okay. Um, we've come a long ways. Let's, let's get across the finish line on this one. So, um, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Public Works, request your approval to add the Bandy Avenue traffic calming device installation to the FY23 Pavement Management 2 project with C.J. Miller in the amount of $81,100. This amount is within the adopted budget. The Department of Public Works has been working with the Bandy Avenue community to address speeding vehicles, concerns within the neighborhood. And again, I'll turn it over to Doug yeah. and Chris. So uh, good afternoon, commissioners. And afternoon. Uh, with this, we have been working with uh, the community. And when I say the community, the entirety of the community for a long time. In fact, when I came into Public Works some years ago, this was a discussion that was ongoing at that point. We've had many community meetings. We've had many back and forth. We have, uh, you know, thought we had a solution uh, one time, probably a year ago. Mm -hmm. However, uh, after consultation with, uh, uh, at the time, C Visa Volunteer Emergency Services Association, mm -hmm. they did not approve of that plan. We went back to the drawing board and have come up with a plan that everyone, uh, and particularly the community, approves of to move forward. Uh, you, you're looking at uh, when we when you see this, um, we 
Uh, we would like to uh, add this work. Uh, we, we put it out to three of our term contractors. C.J. Miller did come back to us uh, with the price that you see in front of you. And while we have much more um, you know, statistics, if you have any questions, uh, this will enable us to add traffic calming in this neighborhood, which, as I said, if, has been discussed for many years. Uh, and I have had many calls from the community over the last week or so since this went on the agenda. They are all so pleased uh, that we're finally at this point. And uh, you may have heard from some of them as well, but they are, they are uh, excited that uh, we could begin construction on this project. So if you have any technical details on it, we're glad to answer those, but that's the crux of why we're here today. What's the makeup of the Center Island? Is it straight curb, mountable curb? It's mountable curb. Oh, yeah. mountable. mountable curb, yes. So the fire engines to go over top of it if right. we need to. Exactly. I, I ride Sullivan Road. <laughs> so um, just to. <laughs> no roundabout. <laughs> put a, a little bit of clarity for my colleagues. Um, this is where town halls really make a difference. Um, early on, a few years ago, it was brought to my attention from the community about this and the concern with you know 40 plus children school age children buses um and just wanting to find a solution there's like hey we got a problem um getting um the fire involved was very important with the speed humps and with the the circle i mean and you know they're not going to just accept something, you know, if it's not within the standard. And um, that brought on more challenges, but it was for all the right reasons. Uh, so coming up with a solution, finally, <laughs> to start putting in place after traffic study and after doing the work, I mean, is huge. Uh, unfortunately, like you say, government can be really slow sometimes, and that's kind of the way I feel about this as opposed to just Calming, devi calming devices and speed humps, Oof. it's a no win. It is. No. This is a tough one. I mean, I'm glad it's done. So, uh, But I'm telling you, that, that's where town halls really make a difference. And that's where open communications makes a difference. So I'll move the Board of County Commissioners, approve the Department of Public Works, to use the current contract with C.J. Miller to complete the installation of the traffic control devices on Bandy Avenue in the amount of $81,100. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Is there any discussion on this? Just a, uh, I guess just like a very general point, not about this in specific, but anytime we have, and I, I guess maybe I'd like to request a slight policy change going forward, is that anytime we have a uh, something that comes before us with like an address or a street if we could have more information about where it is because i, I don't know every road in the county i don't know every you know specific area so that would help me better understand where things are going to better learn about different sure. projects in the county so and and, and i have made a note for mine that when we come before you we'll have districts next to okay uh, all the routing we'll just do the homework and put the district would that be sufficient as, as long as i have a general sense of where yep. it is we'll, so we'll, do the, we'll do our best to get that up there for you th thank you very much i appreciate that so bandy ave is um in eldersburg you got uh Conan oh, so over here is 32. okay okay over here is oklahoma road bandy ave feeds down into bennett okay. down here and we could even show you where Roberta lives. Yeah, no. uh, please don't. Please don't. <laughs> I'd rather not have that out in the public. Okay, we'll show you where Susan Krebs lives. Uh, okay, but good point. Well Th taken. Thank you very much. So, um, okay, we're done with that one, aren't we? Yeah. All no, you didn't vote. No, you didn't I don't vote. You vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now we're done with now that. Now we're one. done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's talk thank about. You. Emergency Medical Services Building. Chief. Morning, Commissioners. Good afternoon to both good of afternoon. you. <laughs> good afternoon. And uh, with me, I think she's been here before, is Tracy Estes, who's our building technician, who um, will be doing most of the talking in the presentation. Um, so the, re the reason... Uh, we're here this morning is um, as of June the 1st, uh, Carroll County will be bringing a portion of EMS billing under uh, 
county building and we have to go through a pretty extensive credentialing and implementation process and uh, board approval is going to be required for two areas one is to first of all set the ems billing rates for the carroll county department of fire and ems and uh, the suggested rates that we're going to present are based upon uh, medicare reimbursement and the amounts the volunteer companies are currently charging and uh, then we're also going to need action on how vigorously the board of county commissioners would like us to pursue in the billing process which uh, tracy has some slides that she's going to go over Well, the Dow is down. <laughs> there we go. Not surprising. <laughs> okay. I know, right? All yours. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> so as Chief said, we're here to obtain approval to set the EMS billing rates and to establish a, for lack of a better word, patient billing process. Um, just some background information. Um, ambulance bills are paid as a transport benefit under one's health insurance. This means that a patient must be transported in order for your health insurance to pay for it. If a patient's not transported, we can still bill for that. It can be billed to the patient's responsibility, auto insurances, um, attorneys for third party types of things. Examples of those fees are a refusal where a patient is evaluated at the scene of an accident, they're not transported to the hospital, um, if they fall and need help getting up, that type of thing. Treat no transport. If we go out and a medic has to give a patient something to increase their glucose because they're having a diabetic event, they wake back up, they don't want to go to the hospital. We can bill them for that. Um, I won't read through all of these, but there are certain ambulance level services, um, which means these are the levels that CMS and federal government set that will decide what we can bill. Um, we can bill for ground mileage if a patient is in the ambulance. We can bill um, an ALS one call, which means a paramedic is required on the call. So basically, when we do the billing, we see what criteria that specific call meets and that's what we, what we bill for. These are just the definitions of those. Could it be multiple? Could it, could no, more than so one? it will either be, um, you'll always have mileage if you transport, uh -huh. and then it'll either be an ALS-1, ALS-2, or a BLS call, basic life support, ALS-1, or ALS-2. Thank you. Um, just one of those codes. These are the suggested fees that we have come up with, and as Chief said, they're based on what other volunteer companies are already charging in the county what other regional agencies are charging. Um, for oxygen, we recommend a $30 flat fee. Mileage, $20 per loaded mile. That means when we come to the house, pick you up from the time you're in the ambulance until you get to the hospital, that's a loaded mile. So that would be $20 per loaded mile. The ALS one where you need a paramedic would be $900. A BLS call, basic life support. You don't need anything uh, more than an EMT, a trained EMT. Um, if you break your arm, break your leg, something like that. An ALS-2 call is a cardiac arrest is a good example of that when you have to shock someone, things like that. Um, treat no transport, again, is where we come out, have to give you some kind of medication or something to wake you up from a diabetic emergency. You don't want to go to the hospital. The charge would be $150. And a refusal, you go to an accident, you evaluate someone, they say, I don't want to go to the hospital. You can bill hundred dollars for that those are our suggestions um, I gave you on the next slide what Medicare pays for those specific codes um, so we can charge you know nine hundred dollars for an ALS one call Medicare is only gonna pay five fifty one thirty one and so the rest would be written off um, treat no transport and refusals are not paid by Medicare so they would be strictly a patient or third-party attorney 
auto insurance bill. Um, one thing to note, though, is that commercial insurances like United Healthcare, Cigna, Aetna, they will pay significantly higher than Medicare. They will reimburse at a higher rate, much higher. Some insurances will pay the full amount that we bill. Um, quickly, just to go through the billing process. I, the, I apologize. I'm what sorry. about Medicaid? Medicaid pays $100, flat fee, no matter what you bill. $100. That's where that um, ESPP program that we've talked about since I started here, while well, we're talking about it, that supplemental money that we get, right? Um, that is where that comes in because CMS, uh, Medicare knows um, we're losing a lot of money on calls yeah. of patients who have Medicaid. So that's why we have to do these very um, detailed reports on staffing costs and right. depreciation, things like that, to get back some of that money. But yeah, Medicaid will pay $100. That's okay. it. Thank that's you. Um, so the, the provider will fill out the report in the field. It'll come to me, and I will review it to make sure it's complete and compliant with everything um, billing. We have all the signatures we need. I'll release the report to Digitech, which is the billing vendor we went with, and they'll bill the payer. If the patient has insurance, then the bill is sent to the insurance company. Now, once the payment is received from the insurance company, either via EFT, a check to our lockbox or credit card, then Digitech will bill the patient for the balance. According to federal regulations, they're, you know, you can't balance bill Medicaid patient. You can't bill Medicare patients for more than what they say you can bill for. Um, if the patient is uninsured, Digitech will send the bill directly to the patient. This is where we need direction from you. We suggest that after an account is considered patient responsibility, meaning we've got what we're going to get from the insurance company, um, the patient should be sent a request for payment of the balance, a statement, a bill that says, you know, this is your portion. After that bill, first bill is sent out, 30 days later, we think that the patient received a second request for payment. At that point, if no payment has been received from the payment 30 days after that second request, so we've sent two statements, we think that the patient's account should be considered unrecoverable or uncollectible and no further action should be taken on the account. Meaning we don't think that patients should be um, sent to a collection agency if they don't pay the bills, that they, um, you know, we don't get it, we don't do harassing phone calls, things like that. We simply send two bills and it, write it off as uncollectible if nothing happens. Our hope is that they'll call to set up a payment plan, you know, once they get the first or second bill. Um, this policy is less than the standard used within the region. Frederick, Anne Arundel, and Baltimore City all send three bills. None of the counties that I've mentioned will um, take an account to collection. They don't use collection agencies. So that was it quickly. <laughs> any questions for me or any clarification? And just to clarify, looking at the county's demographics that we got from planning, the majority of the population in Carroll County is going to be third party insured. So. Um, the revenue should be fairly consistent and should be at close to um, the rates that we plan to charge. And obviously the, the uh, Medicaid's will be at that rate and the Medicare's will be at that rate. And uh, the Medicaid with the additional funding, we should be able to get a cost recovery as long as that program is in effect. We have a meeting with the uh, state health department next week to get us signed up, qualified and ready to go with that. I, uh, I may be oversimplifying things, but I'll, I'll make it quick because I know this isn't really germane. How many stations do we have on board right now to submit their PCRs to you? To me. Starting June 1st, we'll have three, Westminster, Tawnytown, and Sykesville. Okay. July 1st, we'll bring on five more, Mount Airy, Manchester, Reese, Hampstead, and Lineborough. And then the other five are waiting until next okay. year. So that's the bulk. What happens... Yes. How do you know a station has not submitted a PCR? Are, are we are we worried about that? So I have that's part of what I need to do every morning. I'll get a copy of the 
CAD report the you know from the day before of okay. the calls and I'll need to make sure so you're that the one going through all that correct okay yeah. yes and the, the second part of this is before it comes to Tracy we'll be doing a field audit for quality assurance so the medical quality assurance and will be go, will be ultimately passed on through our three chase cars the shift commander then the medical director reviews a certain percentage of those every week so in terms of quality assurance issues that's in addition to what we're going to be evaluating for the building. Now, I'll leave it to you, Chief, about what to do when they don't submit them. So we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, that's part of our process. And right, part, right, yeah, then right I now, have that's, important. Yes. that's part of their challenge. So what we're going to be doing is whether a company is on board or staffed by us, once we have the three chase cars in place, the quality assurance element, we own that already. So that's our legal obligation under Comar Title 30 that we have to do a review of those. Okay. So. Roger. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Is there a motion? Motion to approve the staff recommended billing rates as described. Second. I motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And we need the second motion or no? Yes. Yeah. Motion to approve soft billing so patients will only get two bills. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. An admin, uh, there's uh, closed mm -hmm. minutes from. April 27th um, um, before we go there um, one of the comment cards I have I don't know if mr. Um, Fullerton is still here yes, did you want to make general public comment as well yes. be okay. Okay. okay well that would be uh, this nope. would be the time that sounds good Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, afternoon. Sorry, it's afternoon now. I apologize for oh, holding you guys up. Let me first say I, I do appreciate all the work you guys do. I don't want it to seem like I'm, I'm not, I'm not appreciative of the public service that you guys do because I understand the public service part of it and I, I do very much appreciate it. The actual reason I came here today is just a, it's just a coincidence that the hearing was on restaurants at agriculture because that's kind of part of the reason. But that wasn't the actual reason. The, it's, I'm here today for the accessory uses of these properties, which also includes the restaurants. But we just had a meeting uh, with the Board of Zoning Appeals on that particular location that 75% of the people are talking about. And they said they could not put limits on there to the venues. And I guess my question for the commissioners is why not? Why can't they be more specific and limit what these special accessory people are doing? Because it's really, the hearing is not about restaurants. The hearing about is getting a loophole, which is the restaurant, to the accessory uses. Because once they approve a restaurant in any of these agricultural properties, then the accessory uses are open. So once the accessory uses are open, they don't have to have a public hearing on it, is the way I understand it. There's no more public hearing. It basically turns into access to the venues, whether it be car shows, concerts, weddings whatever it may be it, it turns into quite the fiasco so these situations especially in our situation on our road is growing so rapidly it, it's basically doubling each year in attendance the traffic is growing like crazy um, and there's no uh, limit in sight so now we have national bands coming to this same venue and I won't mention the name because last time I did, they put me on a recurring video online to sell tickets. But the national venue is going to be 1,800 tickets sold plus staff. That's 2,000 people that are going to be in this small venue. Direct access to state to Route 140 with no traffic studies. There's no permit uh, system that I know of for any of this stuff. They're just basically saying, hey, we want to have a concert with 2,000 people. Okay. So that's 2,000 people plus the residents of Pleasant Valley. You can't get in or out of there. How's the fire department get in and out of there? That's direct access to the fire department while these venues are going. 
it's going to be backed up. They just mentioned in those comments, a lot of their customers are coming from Pennsylvania. Well, they're all coming through Pleasant Valley Town. It's not even a two-lane road. There's not even a center line in Pleasant Valley for any of you guys that are familiar with the fire department. Uh, it's, it's really just absurd, and that's what I was basically saying about the ag loophole, because they're bypassing all that stuff in the ag loophole. And then lastly, I'd just like to say I spoke here two years ago when Commissioner Wance was my commissioner. And the only reason I say it is I wanted to remind you his comments. His comments was that his daughter lives on Hugh Shop Road, and he can hear these concerts like he's in the third row. Uh, and that's, that's on video online, of course. So that's how loud it is. I don't want the people watching this online to think that I'm nitpicking something little. This Hugh Shop Road is probably three miles from the stage of this venue. So that's how loud this is. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Is, it, is there, uh, Roberta? Oh, did oh. you have also said, Joan? I'm sorry, I missed it. Yeah, please go ahead. I apologize. One second. Is there a special events permit required? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. I know. Well, for any any events over 500 people, yeah, they have to go through the health department and some other uh, other hoops. It should be. Yes, there. Are. I mean, we can check. There on. is. There no, is. no, no, oh. no. I apologize. Right. Not check about if there is. Check about if they got any up events upcoming. If they've gone through a process, and just ask. We can ask. Yep. You know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you. That's quite right. Th I'm last man standing, so thank you for your time. Uh, I I'd also like to make some comments about my issues with the business of Island Green uh, that adjo adjoins uh, my residential community in an agricultural uh, zone area. Um, uh, initially, for many, many years, uh, they were a good neighbor, uh, an okay neighbor. Uh, an okay neighbor means we don't have any issues with them, they don't have any issues with us. Um, it, it's morphed into a, a not an okay, um, uh, a, a, it's, not, it's not an okay neighbor any longer. Uh, it's morphed into something else. Uh, the owner has gone after uh, purely um, 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 monetary gains. Uh, he's only interested in, in making more revenue. Uh, in doing so, he's gotten a liquor license. Uh, in doing so, he's applied uh, for and, and gotten a restaurant, uh, and now uh, concerts. Um, you know, where is this ending for, this, for, the, for the community? We can't afford, the residents of the community can't afford to put a, a lawyer on retainer to fight him every step of the way. He's gotten these, these, these um, additional revenues by these, um, uh, accessories to a golf course or a driving range. Look at look at his website, please. The web the home page of the website says live music, pub, restaurant, private suites. All the way down at the bottom lists are, lists the driving range. Point is, this is not an accessory to the driving range. He's gotten this because he's he's been able to exploit this loophole of accessory two, and it's wrong. It's wrong for the it's wrong for the um, for the uh, r local residents in this area to be allowed or, or have the um, ability to for the for the one um, um, one business to impact the, the residents of this community. It's, it's just wrong. So I don't know how to stop it. I don't know how that where we can draw the line to prevent this from getting even larger and larger. A few years ago, it wasn't 1,800 uh, people at an at a, at a outdoor revenue or, or an outdoor venue for, for music. What's to prevent next year from having 5,000? Just bring in more porta poly, pot polys, I assume, and you say, I can have, have 5,000 people on my lot, no problem. So how do we, where do we draw the line on this? Island Green is a crystal ball into exactly what is going to happen with changing the ag ag rules to allowing these kind of venues on ag property. I don't mind a farmer having a farm roadside stand selling his produce. You drive up, you put your five hours in the, in the pot, and you take your couple years of corn. That's outstanding. You know, there's, there's many ways that, that ag can be value added, but a restaurant, a bar, concerts or is not, is not uh, added value. 
thank you for your time. Thank you. I think that's it, right? Thank you. <laughs> so, so Ms. Wyndham, la last week mm -hmm. the BZA voted three to two to allow accessory use for Olive Green. I think that was a restaurant, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. So what we just did here today is potentially by taking a look at a possible text amendment would change that ruling. Am I not mistaken? Change. Right. Change it to what? Well, we, well, we that's that's to be determined, and that was the process right. that you sat through here today. Probably step one of several. several. So I think that's important to note. I don't know if mm -hmm. everybody caught that, but yeah, no, no, that's a good point. I mean, the whole idea is to to limit loopholes, limit the, yeah. you know, all of this that you know, what is, limit the intent of what it's designed to do. So. Um, your, your points are taken. I think that that's what we had a conversation yeah. about. Yeah. So, okay. Um, anything else? Roberta. I don't. That's it. Okay. I see uh, closed minutes for land acquisition from April 27th. I need a uh, motion and a second. Motion to approve closed minutes from 4-27-2023. Second. Okay. I got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 For open admin. Um, couple things what you know. oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, look like oh, you always scare so, me I guess I don't um, know I must have a so the conversations this morning were were good dealing with um, the the ag you know ag business all that and then self storage we didn't put any moratoriums in place you know we're we're clear on that we didn't we'll put any I'm sorry moratoriums in place no right, right. No. all we did was and I just want to make sure we're clear now. We sent it to planning and zoning for them to help further define and bring it back to us. Okay. Um, so, okay. Because uh, the, the Prince George's County, you know, piece was they're putting a moratorium. They, that's what they did. Uh, that's not what we're doing. We're, okay. I don't want to pay Prince George's County taxes either. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm just saying, because people were referring to Prince George's. Oh, I know. Like I would, and yeah. they had put that moratorium. We did not. Um, Correct. The other thing is, uh, next week on Tuesday evening, we have our budget um, at the community college, uh, and opportunity for the community to come out and share with us their um, their thoughts, ideas, you know, on the budget as we sit up on stage and take notes and listen um, we have an opportunity right now it's scheduled for the following Tuesday to be a budget work session 16th and the 18th on the 16th and 18th Tuesday and Thursday. we can do it on Thursday the 11th the 11th in the afternoon and this way we don't have to deal with it on the 16th and 18th and then you can also adopt if you do if you if the board were to finish it on the 11th and you could adopt on done. the 18th if you right. wanted to instead of waiting till the 25th so i'm just saying and i we i checked with the uh, budget or roberta did say yes they can accommodate that if that's what we would like to do i'm bringing it to your attention if that's what you would like to do collectively we have time to do it on the 13th or excuse me on the 11th so we'd be doing it on the 11th on the afternoon or yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, my only thought on that would be I think I think it'd be ideal at least to have that conversation shortly thereafter the ninth, to your point. Yeah, that's his right. So I, I I I think that would probably be a wise idea if everybody else would be okay with that. To do it on the eleventh? Yeah. And we would do it after the sheriff's picnic. Yes. Are there any any objections to that? No, I think I can swing that. We're up to Tuesday, and we'll move from there. Okay. Commissioner Garen, you okay with that? I'm trying to follow you. So essentially moving this, the, what was taking place on the 16th, move it to the 11th. That's correct. Okay. After the... Uh, After okay. the sheriff's... The launch. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like yeah. a good idea, okay. actually. Just kind of free up that Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mom, Ms. Wanda? Was there anything for open 
You had nothing else. No. Good afternoon, Wanda. How are you? Okay. Monday, May 8th. Transit Advisory Council at 3 p.m. For, for the, the, the public still here, we're going to review agendas. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of our meeting. Correct. So yeah. you're yeah. welcome to stay, but yeah. I, I mean, you, you look like, uh, yeah, and, and I appreciate it. You came to speak, <laughs> you're more uh, than and you don't want to leave. leave the room as soon as you speak and look rude. She's, but yeah, she you're, you're she not going to see much rude. here in the oh, next five, ten five ten minutes. You will not be disruptive. We by appreciate leaving. that, though. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Go get some lunch. Yeah. Okay. Monday, May eighth, transit. Advisory Council, Commissioner Kyle will be attending in the county office, room 105. Okay. Uh, Tuesday, May 9th, there'll be a public hearing for all of us to attend at the community college, as mentioned, on our FY24 proposed budget. Wednesday, May 10th. Before, do you mind just for a second? So, because I think the public should know this too. Um, as you're well aware, the um, county's going through that economic development land mm -hmm. study, yep. and um, they had their second um, charrette of a sort a couple of weeks, a week and a half ago or so, um, and um, they didn't get quite the turnout they would have liked, so they're going to do a couple pop-up events. Um, one will be before the budget hearing at, at uh, in the entrance of the Scott Center there from 5 to 7 on the 9th, and then the second one will be at the Tony Town Business Breakfast that's coming up later in this month, mm -hmm. so just um, so you know. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because I actually had somebody reach out. They were confused what time mm -hmm. the budget was that evening. So now, thank you for bringing I did that at up. seven, but yes. the others starts at five if folks want to attend. Was, that day is also the Boys and Girls Club. Correct. North I was going to mention yeah. that. Yes. So I don't know if anyone else, since you mentioned it, Commissioner Kyler, um, but Wanda, if you want to put that on at five o'clock on the ninth, uh, Boys and Girls Club of Carroll County, North Carroll, or excuse me, Panther Plex uh, <laughs> tour um, and open house. I know I'm going to. I don't know. I don't know if anyone else is going or not. I'd like to go. I'm okay. Try to. We had a uh, conflict yeah. for the first one, and, <laughs> yep. and I recognize we, which they have two hours set up, but we ought to be able to do it. Get out of there right. by whatever. They, met, they mentioned we could be in and out an hour if we needed yep. to. So. Yep. Okay. Wednesday, May 10th at 9 a.m. Opioid Prevention Coalition meeting. <clears throat> at the Health Department, Commissioner Kyler will be attending. Farm Museum Board meeting at 9.30, Commissioner Vigliotti attending. There's a Board of Education Board meeting. Um, Don't have a volunteer yet. Well, if nobody else can do it, I can make it work. I'll make it work if nobody Commissioner else Commissioner Vigliotti can. will make it work. <laughs> <laughs> On Thursday, May 11th, um, we have, let's see. Approval to transfer FY23 annual housing bond allocation. State and local fiscal recovery funds update, the FRF um, funds update with uh, Ms. Windham and the entire team. Third quarter FY23 budget update from Mr. Zaleski. Construction of outfall and stream stabilization improvements down in South Carroll. Construction inspection services for the outfall and stream stabilization, again in South Carroll, treatment plant. Um, and then we have the sheriff's annual picnic right across the way. Wanda, you can add me to that as well. And That's not a public event, just making sure. I mean, you're, it's on the agenda because you're attending, but it's right. Um, I'll be attending the Humanum's 50th anniversary celebration. Uh, we have some Humanum footprints here in Carroll County dealing with autism, so down in South Carroll. So I'm looking forward to that. Then at 7 p.m., the 8th Annual Drug Overdose and Prevention Vigil, Commissioner Gordon and Kyler will be attending at the Portico, St. John's Portico. I apologize. So you saying potentially at one o'clock yes. may be the yeah. budget, so depending on unless the budget people say they no, can. No, no, oh, no, it will they be. Can. They That'll can. be for sure. Yeah. Okay, so, good. So I apologize, Wanda. At one p.m., uh, if you can put um, budget proposed FY24 budget discussion decision. 
No. Uh, just deliberations. Yeah. Del yeah. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Gordon has the podcast on the fourteenth. Uh, excuse me. May fifteenth. 7th Annual Carroll County Chamber of Commerce Public Safety Awards. Uh, Commissioner Gordon Kyler and myself will be attending. On Tuesday, May 16th, Commissioner Gordon will participate in the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, downstairs in the Reagan Room. Then the Board of County Commissioners open session at 1 p.m. now is a tentative, correct? On uh, Tuesday? Um. I, yeah, I guess so. I'm sorry, Commissioner <coughs> Rossi. Wanda, would you add me to the, the Chamber of Commerce Public Safety Awards on Monday morning, please? Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, Commissioner Rossi. Oh, it's all good. Veterans Advisory meeting. Commissioner Gordon and Kyler will be attending that afternoon at 2 p.m. Wednesday. Uh, there's a Mako Corporate Partner Cruise in Annapolis. I guess I'm attending. Maybe somebody else wants to attend. Carroll Community it's College. To, it's huh? open to anyone. It's not oh. just. I it's not just a board. I don't know. I know I'm attending and Ted's attending. I, it so may I think it may working. just be board of directors, but I, I'll, we could check. Carroll Community College Board of Trustees meeting. <laughs> Commissioner Kyler is attending at five, and ESAC, Commissioner Garen is attending that evening at seven. On Thursday. We have a uh, briefing and possible decision on common letter for Westminster annexation, uh, the Ellsworth uh, Cemetery, approval and submission for the FY2427 area plan and individual grant for aging disabilities. At 1 p.m., we have scheduled the uh, FY24 adopted budget work session, which yeah. I doubt will occur. Yeah, well, that could, that if if the board finishes and on the 11th, on the 11th, done. then that would probably be budget adoption, right? Sometime, which we could probably do in the morning. You, so, um, on Friday, 10 a.m., 16th annual Fallen Heroes Memorial Service. It's at the uh, Public Safety Center in Sykesville. I'll be attending. Saturday, May 20th, uh, there's a Eagles Court of Honor for Mr. Ryan and Commissioner Gordon <laughs> will be attending. Yep. And Commissioner Guerin has the podcast on the 21st. Alisakis. Huh? Alisakis. Yep, and he's the 100. Alisakis, actually. He was on Alisakis. my kids' little league team. Ryan was he? Alisakis. I knew when he was like this. He's the 120th, if I remember correctly, Eagle Scout from 381. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Nice round number. Yes, that's awesome. Did I miss anything, Wanda? No. Okay. Did I miss anything, Mr. Burke? Nope. Just Alisakis. Alisakis. That's you. You're just waiting all day to say that. So. Okay. Adjourn. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye.